Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. My name is Zaki Hassan, and you're not listening to an episode from 2019 or before. I'm, we're here now. We're in the city of Chicago. I'm here with Parvez Ahmed. That's right. Thank you, Zaki. A voice from the past, just when he thought he was out, uh, I pulled him back in to quote a Godfather reference. I figured apropos. I, I gladly walked in, I should say. <laughs> Zaki happened to be coinciding a visit to Chicago while we were here. As I'm reminiscing with my old co host, <laughs> I can't forget about my present Yeah, I'm co-host. still here. I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> Omar, I'm sorry. So we've got the, uh, the trio. We are in downtown Chicago. And furthermore, we are on the historic State Street. We are at CARE's offices here in the beautiful city of Chicago. Beautiful offices of CARE, I should say. And we are joined today by... Yes, alhamdulillah. We are with Ahmed Rehab. Welcome, Ahmed. Salam alaikum. Thank you. Alaikum salam. A little quick intro. Ahmed Rehab is the executive director of the Chicago Office of the Council on American Islamic Relations, CARE, as well as CARE's National Strategic Communications Director. CARE is the nation's largest Muslim civil liberties and advocacy group. A prolific writer and lecturer on contemporary social issues, which we'll be dabbling in today and talking about today, civil rights, media relations, Islam West relations. Ahmed lectures at various university campuses in Chicago and around the nation. He regularly comments as a guest on various local TV and cable news programs and radio stations. He's been interviewed by news publications such as the Chicago Tribune, the Chicago Sun-Times, the Daily Herald, the Washington Post, the Orlando Sentinel, the Economist, the Boston Globe, uh, Germany's D Zeit. Don't don't uh, don't comment on <laughs> my German Zeit. accent. D Zeit. Okay, and many more. His op-eds have been published in numerous newspapers around the country. He holds a master's degree in software engineering from DePaul University and a bachelor's in psychology from UIC. Ahmed serves as a board member of the Illinois Coalition of Immigrant and Refugee Rights, that's ICIRR, a co-founder of the Bridge Initiative at Georgetown University, and he served as a board member and secretary of the Egyptian American Society, a member of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, Muslim Task Force, and an Eisenhower Fellow of the American Assembly. So welcome, Ahmed. Thank you so much, Omar. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be with you guys. Um, you know, you have a really popular and well-loved podcast, so it's a pleasure to be on. Oh, no, thank you. It's interesting. I, I didn't mention this off-air, but I think the second episode we ever did, right, Zaki, was Zahra Bilu. That's right. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, yeah. You've come full yeah. circle. <laughs> that's right. Ten years, almost ten, ten years. years. Almost mm-hmm. exactly ten years ago. And yeah. there's a little history with folks here in the room, right? I mean, me personally, I just... I don't know yeah. Ahmed. Other than through via social media. I yeah, yeah. Through social media, I love reading your posts. Honestly, probably the posts that resonate most with me on, on, on social media. So I appreciate that. And I, I always Well, I thank you very think, much. It's yeah, funny, I'm, sure. I'm on Facebook. I'm not on Twitter at all. At all. Yeah. I still can't do Instagram. Me. So I'm still one of those. I guess I date myself by yeah. just being a Facebook animal. But that's <laughs> where I linger. The problem with Facebook is that they play with the algorithms all the time. So I get punished a lot with the shadow banning mm. after I post something they don't like. And so you go from yeah. 10,000 people in, in, in your engagement to like five or 10 for mm. a few yeah. weeks. And that's right. It's very yeah. frustrating. That's right. But, but there's uh, some there's yeah. some other connections here too in the room, right? Well, I mean, I think this wouldn't have happened had it not been, I think, for Zeki reaching out. So Zeki and uh, Ahmed certainly share a history. Uh, if you guys went I, I mean, we were just talking. I mean, yeah. we've known each other for close to 30 years now. 28 years to be which, exact. Uh, which, I mean, uh, you and I are both uh, 18 years old, so I don't know how that's... <laughs> the math the doesn't add friendship. up. <laughs> no, I, the Hassans, you know, yeah. they, they played an important part of, of my early life in the United States. You know, awesome. I came here in wow. uh, 1992 as a junior in high school graduated Maine South, same uh, school as Hillary Clinton. Uh, nothing to boast about, but just an interesting little tidbit. And, and uh, Harrison Ford, <laughs> as Wait, a matter where, of fact. Where, where is that? Uh, it's out in Park Ridge. It's a suburb close to, to Rosemont, where ISN always has uh-huh. its conferences. Yeah. So anyway, so graduated in 94, and then basically at UIC, I met Junaid Hassan, you know, Zaki's older brother. Yeah. And Zaki, for a long time, was my best friend's little brother until I started to follow his work in the on the internet. Uh, but yeah, since that time, we've, we've, we've known each other, so 28 years. So you came here in ni- 1992 from where? From Cairo, Egypt. So I was born okay. in Cairo, Egypt. Mm. I spent my childhood there in Manchester, England, the Midlands of England, and then came here at the age of 15, 1992. Are you going to A junior, junior in high school. How was that like? I mean, that's a pretty, to immigrate to a new country as a teenager. That's, it was definitely challenging, yeah. especially the school I chose was very homogenous. Um, mm. I had the option of picking other schools, yeah. 
but I kind of went for the preppy one thinking it would be better in academics and it was mm. it was really good academically but socially it was definitely a challenge it wasn't okay. as welcoming as I would have liked mm. um, I was the black kid there that gives you an idea of the of the white level of the school okay. um, you know I'm not <laughs> that dark but you know I was totally you know the African uh, American in that school because they had none and uh, you know as an Egyptian you identify with that yeah. Um, but you also identify with, you know, Mediterranean European culture, you know, as Egyptians were multicultural, but the problem wasn't with any of this. The problem was with the specific culture of that small town where everybody knew each other mm. and they were very closed up on each other. They thought Park Ridge was the center of the universe. So it wasn't really easy to make friends in that school. In 1992, that's right after the Iraq war. I mean, I remember, you know, I was in high school. You and I are of the same vintage, uh, although I graduated high school in 92, just, just to, mm -hmm. you know, put it in perspective. But I remember, yeah, uh, sophomore and junior year, I mean, the, the uh, Persian Gulf War, uh, the right. first Persian Gulf War right. was... And you're not fully aware guess. of these things at that age, of, but yeah. the consequences mm -hmm. of these That's things I mean. you are very palpable to you. Mm -hmm. You know, people walk around with uh, those, uh, you know, Scud this, Saddam, you know, right. T-shirts yeah. and Halloween, whatnot. they this, still have these Arab costumes yes. at the time. But, you know, coming from England, England was no walk in the park for a minority person so in the true. 80s. Yeah. You know, we, we lived in what you might call the projects. Instant, interestingly, my father, we, we went to England for him to do his PhD okay. in chemical engineering. And so the Egyptian government, for some reason, I guess, was looking for a good rate. And so they picked this one apartment in what turned out to be the projects of Manchester, a oh. small town called Salford. Yeah. So everybody there was either an immigrant family doing graduate work or local families that were essentially on what you would call welfare here in the United States, you know, an estate uh, property, as they would call it in England. We didn't know any of this. All we knew is that it was an interesting place to live. I mean, I remember walking down the stairs of the building and every morning being um, welcomed by fresh graffiti that would say something like F off foreigners is what they called, you know, immigrants at the time, foreigners. Obviously, that's changed a lot. Back then, the only community that you can feel was there as a minority was the Indopak community. I was going to say, is Manchester kind of an enclave for that yeah. or, or was back then? It, it was, like Birmingham and Birmingham. Bradford and mm -hmm. et cetera. Um, and so we, we basically were identified as Pakis is what they would call them, Pakis. right? Mm -hmm. And there was all derogatory. these derogatory names that were yeah. given to that group. Things have changed drastically. Now you see, you know, what they call Asians, you know, come to to power in, in various places, in, in, in culture, in media, in arts, in, in politics. Uh, interestingly for me, both the Prime Minister of Scotland and the Prime Minister of England are, you know, sons of, of that community. Yeah. I uh, never thought I'd live to see the day, but here we are. So that definitely gave you a certain strength because you had to deal with that at a young age. Now, we lived in a small enough town and went to a nice little Catholic school. Mind you, as you might know, England is a Protestant, mostly Anglican Protestant country. Correct. So the Catholics in England are likely to be either Irish, Scots-Irish, Scottish, or something like that. So right. the school we went to are multi-generational English families of Irish origin. Okay. And so I was sort of the minority in the minority, I mean, that school, St. James, that I went to is a school that would be beat up, beat up on by the other Protestant schools in the area. And I was the only Muslim kid, literally, in that school. So literally the minority of the minority. But that gave you, again, a certain perspective and a certain strength, made good friends with the kids in that school. That was definitely an environment that was home. But it gave me a certain ability to deal with the challenges coming into the United States. And how? what were those challenges initially in the U.S.? Like, what were your initial experiences presumably that led you to the path that you're on now but i'm curious what were, what were those initial experiences well interestingly the first impression of americans in general and these high school kids that that i interacted with at, at main south was that they were really friendly on the exterior right the first impression that they're smiling they're nice they're polite which is different from what what you might get in england in the 80s i mean kids you know, they would call each other names, you know, if you're obese or if you have a certain physical feature or if you're of a certain color. It was very common to call people nicknames, derogatory nicknames for fun based on that feature that you might have. And there was nothing wrong with that. This was obviously a pre-politically correct age, pre-internet, pre-all these campaigns that later came to teach people not to do these types of things. But basically, I was used to that. So when I came here and there was this political correctness and this external, you know, warmth and, you know, smiley type of interaction, I was like, wow, this is a great pl place with great people. But a couple of weeks, a couple of months into it, you found for me that 
this was all there was to it. I couldn't get beneath that external surface. You couldn't make friends. You couldn't have a deep conversation. You're not really accepted. Whereas in England, you could be. You could crack through the surface and make deep friends. I think in Europe in general, and people have this debate all the time about how Europeans seem cold and awkward and unfriendly, but when you get to know them, they let you in. And this ranges from the English to the Russians and everything in between. And in the United States, it's more you know this transactional culture of have a nice day, let me sell you this product, polite, I yeah. need to be smiling. But really, they're afraid to get into deep conversations with people or let them into their spaces. That was my experience initially. Yeah, I, I know that, at least from a sociological perspective, often you read, uh, I haven't lived in Europe, so I can't speak to this, and I'm very curious your, uh, about your experiences. This sort of model of uh, immigrants finding a new home in Europe is multicultural or multiculturalism, mm -hmm. and here it's assimilation, essentially. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you, is that something that you, exp is, it, is it as stark of a contrast? and noticeable or palpable, you know, when you moved here. I would agree with that okay. as an adult, you know, having yeah. traveled and, and seen the world. At the time, it wasn't really on my mind. I mean, we, I, I don't come from a family that is heavy culturally, meaning we didn't really identify with any certain, you know, cultural traditions that would set us apart from any mainstream, you know, neighborhood or community that we might live in, whether in dress or outlook or, you know, it, it was essentially this family that, you know, comes from a very metropolitan city, you know, Cairo, upper middle class, um, had traveled the world before. We spoke English already, albeit with an accent. That, that had to be an adjustment. So uh, that wasn't really on my mind. I didn't really identify as, oh my God, this is a culture shock. There was right. no culture shock to be had. It was more in the human interaction and the attitude that I never really got over. I mean, I, I learned to live with it, but to a degree, I still have criticism of how we in America maintain that transactional exterior of friendliness right. that doesn't go far when it matters. And so you still, and it's not even for me because I have my set of friends and we go deep and they're multi, from different races and religions. But as I see American society in general, you know, I kind of pity, I pity the situation where I see, you know, neighbors who barely get family visiting them. People at work have these very, you know, surface oriented conversations and don't dig deeper beyond that. And you get this loneliness and you get the depression and families are afraid to go to Thanksgiving. They don't want to meet uncle Bob or, oh my God, I'm going to see my mother for Christmas. And we always like, why, why don't you want to do that? Why is that a, a burden? Why right. is that a problem? So in that sense, I mean, I, I think, you know, you certainly had some remnants, I don't, I don't want to say remnants, but like rooted in, in a cultural tradition that values family, that values communal living as opposed to the, the kind of stark individualism that America exemplifies. That is 100% yeah. correct. Yeah. And add to that, you know, a very American feature, uh, probably now it is happening around the world because there is a sort of Americanization that has right. happened in the world in the last, you know, few decades that's been exacerbated with the rise of the internet and cable television and, yeah. and this, you know, mobile phones, et cetera. I mean, you could be in Korea or in China, or in Egypt for that matter, and find teens that act and behave and dress and speak the same way Americans do, sometimes with the exact same English words. But at the time, we weren't in that world yet. And so one of the things that was very American to me that, again, now is globalized, is this idea of cliques. This idea that you kind of had to find your clique and you had to adjust and fit and conform within that clique. Now, whether it was the goths or the skinhead, well, I don't know if we were skinheads in the United States, but you know what I mean. I like know these what different mean. groups, you jocks. know, the, the jocks, the yeah. the nerds, the, whatever yeah. it is. Right? Headbangers. <laughs> yeah, head exactly. Bangers, yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, 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 I can't stand that idea. I, on purpose, refuse to belong to anything and try to stand out as a sore thumb, even though that was the, the worst thing you could do. This was like, you know, cultural suicide to try to do that in high school. I remember one time, to give you an example, everybody was talking about the prom and I had this one friend, this Hong Kong, I think it was, or yeah, he was from Hong Kong. It was American, but originally from Hong Kong, Kevin. He tried to fend for me because people asked me like, who are you going to the prom with? Mm. And I said, I'm not going to the prom. And then Kevin felt like he needed to jump in and save my future in the school. And he said, he, you know, he's going to visit his aunt in Michigan that weekend. And I said, nope. I'm not. I'm staying here in Chicago and I'm not going to the prom. Yeah. <laughs> Why aren't you going to the prom? Is it because religious reasons? Like, not really. I mean, partially, but the main reason is I wouldn't have thought to go had you not told me I needed to go. It wasn't Ooh, a natural or intuitive thing for me to do. So mm. for me to do it now would mean I'm doing it just because you are. Yeah. And that's not a good enough reason. And I made a point to articulate it to everybody in exactly that way. Again, it didn't earn you many friends, maybe a little bit of respect, 
but I kind of started to get off on on you know be, being myself, but you know which is supposed to be the American dream. There you go. Every Disney movie, Mulan, whatever. But in real life, <laughs> everybody's oh, trying it, to conform. That's right. We talk about individualism all the time, but it's one of the least individualistic society in my estimation I've ever come across. It seems like you were just that was you know who you are inherently. You were just inherently nonconformist. Right, and right? even because like you said, it wasn't necessarily cultural or religious right. reasons that, that that forbade you and we can get into that right. I, I, yeah. I would like to actually explore that because how, how is that sort of at, in terms of the household but but it was just like yeah i'm not going to do it because it didn't make sense yeah. i mean it has it has to make sense it has mm-hmm. to be something i actually want and i need to have a conversation with myself mm-hmm. and i've done this since a young age and it's carried me through life about why i do the things that i do do i do it to please someone to fit in to be accepted I would never want to do that because to me, the smacks of weakness that I don't want to see myself as, mm-hmm. and it just doesn't make any sense. Go, no, finish Well, I was going to give you one more example. It's, it had to do with brands. So everybody, I, I guess until now, but definitely back then, you know, brands, you know, you want to wear a Nike or an Adidas or this or that, or this kind of jacket or this is in. And, you know, I kind of made the point to not to wear the most generic clothes that were nice looking in my estimation, you know, from Kmart at the time or H&M or whatever. And people still, you know, they try to make a point of that. I said, right. why would I want to? Like, you're looking at me sort of in a negative light, but you're the guy who's not getting paid to advertise someone's name. And that's all you're doing. <laughs> you're advertising someone's name because it's the same quality product made in Vietnam or China or whatever. And you're the fool who's doing it for free and you get nothing out of it. <laughs> so why would you want me to, to play into that? So is that, uh, or were you going to ask a question? No, yeah. no, go ahead and finish your question. Uh, well, I, I was going to ask Zucky actually, because, I, you know, our background, also born in the United States, but then lived or spent a considerable amount of time overseas. And then you came, you come back to the United States, specifically Chicago, mm-hmm. uh, settling in Chicago. How are your experiences either similar or dissimilar to what kind of Ahmed's mm-hmm. describing? I'm just curious from your own kind of Well, I, I've often said that yeah. the, the first uh, half year of school. I, I moved, we, you know, my, my family lived in Saudi Arabia for 10 years and um, I had started school there, but I went to an American school for a big chunk of that time. And when we, we moved back in fall of 92. And so I, I had one year of junior high and I still to this day say, I think junior high is when people are just like, they're objectively worst. Like they, like mm-hmm. y- you're just the worst yeah. <laughs> and hopefully you learn. That's the theory. <laughs> And so it was. It was a very difficult adjustment. I went to a school in uh, Orland Park called uh, Jerling Junior High, and I, I to this day I'm like that half year is the most miserable half year of my life. Like, and I guess mashallah, right? I mean, big picture, that's you know, that's if that's the worst time of my life, that's pretty good, you know. Yeah. But I like in terms of just trying to trying to find my footing and you know and and I, I always use this example where you know when I first started there there was a student who had been assigned to kind of like just show me around and make sure I was I knew where to go and stuff and like maybe a couple weeks later he's like hey you know how have you been you know are you fitting in okay whatever it's another student and I'm mm-hmm. like oh you know it's been a little you know it's been a little rough and he goes well you know if you're gonna fit in you have to lose that accent and this is how I've always talked and I'm like my accent is, I don't even know what I'm talking, what's going, you know, like yeah. what's going on here, you know? And it was a very, that, that in, I mean, in the span between 92 and 94, I went to four different schools. Wow. Uh, you know, in, in Riyadh, uh, two, two junior highs and yeah. then another high school. So, I mean, the, it was, right. it was rough sledding, but you know, I'm glad I, I got past it. I, I certainly don't, don't look back with, with any, any sort of vitriol, but yeah, I mean, it was, I can definitely like some of the stories that you're telling. I'm mm-hmm. like, yeah, no, I can, I can definitely feel that, yeah. And you're resilient, you know. Yeah. Humans are resilient. Right. You know, I never spoke to my parents about any of this to right. this day. Mm-hmm. I didn't really, really speak to to it publicly. I mean, when I'm when I'm asked, you know, in sort of casual conversations like this, it might come out. It definitely shapes you, mm-hmm. and it manifests in you. And I think one of the things I got out of that experience was being very averse to bullying. Um, I wasn't bullied per se. I mean, I was given the stiff shoulder treatment. It, it was almost as if the entire school got together, you know, preschool and, and said, let's treat this guy the same way. Let's all give him the side eye. Let's all not have a, a proper conversation. Let's kind of make him feel awkward. That was my feeling. I remember one time in art class, and this is when things changed. Um, I hadn't really spoken to anybody for you know, weeks. 
you know, just walk in the hallways on my own with my books, et cetera. And I was sitting in, in, in art class much the same way I normally do, doing my art. I was a pretty good artist. And I, I heard a couple of guys across this long art table snickering. And this wasn't new to me. You know, they were talking about me. I could feel it. This wasn't new. But then they dropped the word Allah. Somebody said something about Allah. At that point, I got up from my chair. This was a very creepy moment for everybody involved, I'm sure. <laughs> this is the guy who never talks. Walked around this, the length of the table, not not the short end of it. Uh, to right. kind of like prolong the moment all the way. And at that moment, they don't know Cinematic. what I was going to do. Am I going to smack the guy? Am I going to blow it up? <laughs> yeah. You know, I arrived to him and very politely I say, did you say Allah? Yeah, I was talking to him. I'm like, okay, but you were talking about me. So if you want to talk about someone in the third person, it's not very polite. You might want to talk to them directly. Well, I just don't know. I'm asking, look, if you don't know, if, if you profess ignorance, why don't you ask a question? Maybe I'll, I'll be happy to answer you. Very cool, calm, you know, a little bit creepy, like I said. <laughs> and the guy's like, oh, sure, man. Yeah, that's cool. No, I appreciate that. And he gave me a big old handshake. And since that time, they would always say hi and give handshakes in, in the hallways. And, right. you know, and to be quite frank, you know, by the second year, by my senior year, you know, things had changed. Uh, never made any deep friendships, none that linger, just one Polish guy who ended up, you know, moving around the world, hating Park Ridge. And that was the guy I became long life friends with. But, you know, I did see bullying and and the I was very averse to bullying as a result. My presence at CARE Chicago many years later, you know, founding this chapter of CARE was informed by this anti-bullying spirit. Because to wow. me, Islamophobia is an adult form, right. a communal form of high school bullying. Yeah, they pick on wow. pick on the, the the guy that they think they can get away with it. Yeah, I was going to ask like, what are the you you mentioned that anti bullying informed your current uh, career path? What were the other things that you were into, and were they social issues that you were thinking about at the time? Because in your bio, I saw that you did engineering, mm -hmm. and I thought that was really interesting that you ended up in in the engineering space and then have since. Uh, like myself, in fact, come out of, done engineering, then come out, out of it and gone into other fields? Well, quite frankly, I mean, like many of our lives, things, you look back at one's biography and it wasn't pre-planned. It wasn't, you know, hard set in stone and, and, and cut neatly. It was a bit of a, a sloppy mess and hmm. things happened as they went along. So the way, the way things happened for me, since I was a small child, like many of our families, I thought I was going to be a doctor. My parents thought I was going to be a doctor. I was always good in school, getting good grades. So that was a natural culmination mm -hmm. of that, you know, academic prowess. And I had no problem with that. I mean, I loved the idea. I loved biology, did really well uh, in it, et cetera. But as I got closer to that process, and I did start pre-medical, you know, the courses, I did pre-medicine, did the MCAT, all that stuff, scored mm. well. Oh, wow. But, you know, as I got closer to it, I didn't like the lifestyle in the United States of a doctor. I felt it was too much commitment. And I knew myself to be what you would call, or at least I would call, a universal Womo, a man of the world. I liked art and reading and travel and, you know, film and 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 social life, family life, etc. And I felt like, and maybe wrongly, but I felt like it was too much of a commitment to one thing, regardless of how great it was and how much I may like it. I'm not that kind of guy. So I started to have cold feet, and it was it took my father, uh, Rahimahullah, he passed away last year. Oh, to knock on my door, I remember that, just one, one evening, knocked on my door, my bedroom door, came in, sat at the foot of the bed and said, you know, Hamada, which is my nickname in, in Egyptian, for Ahmed, uh, you don't have to do this. And I just smiled back and said, thank you. <laughs> and that was it. I was out of that, that path. <laughs> so now I was left with being a senior in college and being a Middle Eastern male, Muslim, you know, I'm pre-programmed to feel like I need to be a provider. I need to find a proper career. It can't be English lit. Can't be history, can't be the things I like or geography. So what's left? You know, at the time, law, believe it or not, wasn't all that for a, from a Middle Eastern Muslim male. Like back home, lawyers, you know, it's not it's not a great career. Yeah. Obviously, now you know I understand. And, and a few years from from that point, I had uh, already understood that being a lawyer would be a great thing. It would, probably would have matched my my personality more. But I ended up choosing engineering as sort of the only legitimate left, you know, career that I could yeah. pursue at that point. I ended up doing a master's and a bachelor's combined mm. in oh. order to catch up at DePaul. Okay. At DePaul. And graduated with that, worked at Arthur Anderson, at the time a Fortune 500 term uh, uh, company for yeah. a few years. And then came 9-11 and came the opportunity to start something like this and jumped into it because that was always the area that I felt my personality was better attuned to, you know, public speaking, um, communal yeah. issues, debating, fighting bullies, et cetera. 
I want to like dive a little deeper into uh, some of the areas that you just sort of covered in a nutshell. Your own sort of maybe um, religious sensibilities growing up, like what, mm. what was that like in terms of family life? And then if you could, because I know, again, just anecdotally and, and from friends' experiences, you know, coming to UIC, or I mean, I think for a lot of undergrads, when they, when, when they come to the undergraduate level and they are either exposed to the MSA or to other Muslims, that's a whole different, that's a whole new world in some cases. Mm -hmm. And I know UIC in the 90s mm -hmm. had a particular flavor. Are yeah, you comfortable talking uh, about that? I'd love for you to talk about that. Multilayered. Uh, look, in terms of rel religious sensibilities, mm -hmm. um, even though I mentioned we're not, you know, culturally heavy as a family, Islam was always super important to us. I shouldn't say, you know, despite, because these two things can absolutely coexist. I mean, Islam is not a heavy culture. Islam is a set of values and ideals, and they can implement, they can manifest themselves in many various cultural forms. So God consciousness, I think, is the way I would describe um, my religious sensibility. It was always there very strongly. Mm -hmm. um, I know this because I remember my childhood in great detail, but also because just... I think a couple of days ago, I came across a couple of letters that I had written my late father when I was 12. And he was back in England. We had moved to Egypt. He went back to England for a postdoc. And these letters were discovered by my mother, who was in Egypt a couple of uh, months, uh, weeks ago. And she was, you know, cleaning out his room there. And he had kept those letters all these years, over 30 years. So she gave them to me and I read them. And they were filled with religious advice for my father, who was <laughs> in England, and how to deal with being alone and you know, what to yeah. do, the prayers he should do, how he should think of God, how he should think about his future, if things work out, if they don't work out, it's written, it's fate, you know, etc. So that was always a part of the DNA. You know, I, I didn't walk around feeling or thinking or trying to be religious. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an identity, but the God consciousness yeah. was always there, in, especially in the right and the wrong. You know, in, in the good and the bad, like what mm. you, sh you know, this, you can't do this, you shouldn't do that. Yeah. Like that was moral, compass. It, moral it, compass. Moral compass, morality. Informed that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and definitely a sense of affinity for God and Muslims and Islam. So that was definitely there, yeah. right? Yeah. The, the idea that Islam and Muslims was a thing that mattered greatly to right. us in our lives. Um, even though we weren't around a lot of Muslims for most of, of my childhood or late, you know, um, youth, you know, youth and late youth. Okay. As far as your second question with, with UIC, it was very particular. This was my first interaction with an American um, religious Muslim experience because, uh -huh. I mean, South, there were yeah. no Muslims, as I mentioned, no minorities. So in that sense, it was a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like, wow, there are more people like me. Mm -hmm. And remember, this is kind of pre-internet. The internet was just breaking out. Right. Because, you know, young people will listen to this and say, what are, you, what are you talking about? But literally back then, we were in an oasis in that little neighborhood that we lived in. I mean, I remember hearing rumors that were other Muslims down in this area called Bridgeview. And there were many of them like, <laughs> what? <laughs> in this city? There are yeah. other Muslims? You're and right. there are a lot of them? And right. what, you, can, you can literally see them as you drive, hijab. Like, what? That image to me was like, wow. Because okay. you thought America was, was your street and school and neighborhood yeah. at the time. Yeah, yeah. Again, no internet, you know, a few stations on TV. So there wasn't interaction you can get outside of your personal body experience that's right and of course i wasn't going to drive down to bridgeview back in 1992 you know just for the heck of it so uic was that first sort of interfacing yeah. with with the existence of muslims and, and that was a pleasant experience at first <laughs> <laughs> so i mean we, we don't need to necessarily name the particular flavor but uh, we could but it's it's very political uh are you now also kind of being introduced to political islam Per se? That, that was always the defining force of organized Islam in America. Okay, or you, that's how you would characterize it? Well, obviously, yeah. Even I beyond mean, I, UIC? Yes. Okay. I mean, it's not, not in the organizational sense, but in the cultural sense. How so? So, so not in the sense of this particular organization, sure. Muslim organization or Muslim uh, political uh, entity, but in the culture that comes with it. So okay. there's a culture around it, uh, right? I see. Okay. And so as people identify with that culture, just like any other human phenomenon, you kind of lose sight of the forest from the trees and the details and you just live out something. You can't even tell why you're doing it or why you think the way you do or you behave the way you do. It's just there. So I think those, let's put it this way, back up a little bit. So Muslims have, have always been coming into this country. I'm not going to get into these caveats. We know that, you know, yeah. the slaves ever sure. since that time and, and beyond and 
Uh, there were some in the 1900s. But the wave of immigrant Muslims that filled the spaces that became ISNA and ICNA and MASS and UIC and the MSAs. And, right. Post-1965. They all came as students yeah. in the 60s mm-hmm. to begin with and 70s and 80s and 90s, etc. And, and, and it took a certain kind of person to come to a country like this and have the opportunity to get rich and take care of themselves and stop there, but choose to not only work hard and provide for their families in a land in which the language is new, the culture is new, um, the habits and, you know, are new, but also to have the wherewithal and the patience and the breadth of, of spirituality to also Desi- want to build a mosque yeah, and desire. the center and, and the community. Oh. So who would, who would that person be? It would be someone who was disciplined in a movement. Mm. It wasn't your random immigrant. No. It wasn't your Arab Fonzie, right? <laughs> uh, it was the guy or, or the woman who came from a, a community or a family that were an environment in which there was some kind of organized movements Very of true. Islam. Very true. And so the ones that were basically around in the 20th century, in the mid-20th century, that influenced people that way, tended to be, you know, Jamaat Islamiya and uh, yeah, Muslim, yeah, the Muslim that's Brotherhood. Right. That's right. But it's not to say the way some Islamophobes put it, like this was some kind of conspiracy or that they came as card-carrying members of an organization with yeah. a agenda. Narr- yeah, an agenda and right. a mission that they had to accomplish, you know, a sleeping cell. None of that yeah. crap. Yeah. I mean, this is just how humans develop naturally. They get influenced by things yeah. and they influence other things. And many of these individuals were not actually in their growth here in America members of a movement or organization, but the culture was there. Right. And the culture spread and it defined, I think, the organized, let's put it this way, because there are many others who are not part of that, organized Muslim community. This includes the Masajid, this includes the larger national organizations and their spinoffs, this includes the MSA. Very, very astute. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, As but, time progressed, I yeah. mean, you know, different movements and different counter movements, you know, uh, uh, happened and, and, and things changed. But this this is the origins of things, in my opinion, and they still linger t- to a large degree. Um, you you really quickly went from graduating with an engineering <laughs> degree and working at and consulting to getting the opportunity to fa- found care. Uh, yeah, the Chicago I, chapter. Yeah, the Chicago chapter. Yeah, the of Chicago course. chapter. Yeah. Um, there's probably a lot of a lot of background there. 9-11, of course, was uh, mm-hmm. right around that time, mm-hmm. I presume, right? Yeah. 20 years, yeah. 20 plus years ago. What was the spark? What was yeah. the opportunity? So for me, from my perspective, it was me wanting to be a part of fighting back and standing up for my community and my religion. I was angered by the lies. I was angered by the, the feeling, the idea out there that we're just a low-hanging you know, branch and anybody can come and pick the fruit and slap you around and you're, you're a doormat for people. Like, that offended me. So I always had the sense of pride. I guess I should mention pride as one of my Muslim sensibilities. Yeah. Definitely that was um, a factor mm-hmm. in, in, in my decisions and, you know, motivating me and inspiring me to want to do something. Yeah. Um, I saw Muslims as a great people and Islam as a great religion. And I'm like, nah, we're not playing that game. <laughs> I'm not going to sit back and watch you play that game. Yeah. So I came in it with a, with attitude. You know, I didn't come in it to necessarily sing Kumbaya and make peace. And the interfaith <laughs> stuff I wasn't interested in at all, at all. Hmm. And even the way I did my interviews very early on, it was always to, you know, hit back and, 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 and counterattack and sometimes attack first. And <laughs> the reason why I did that is to, in much, the same way that the sort of the nation of Islam back in the day, yeah. they had this sort of aura of... And it went a little too far, of course, and they, they talk about this, they're scholars, right? But they had to do it because they had to break the hubris of the slave owner's descendants and how they looked mm-hmm. in a very negative That's right. light on African American. It's all about these dynamics. Yeah. It's all about, I'm too good for you, you're not good enough for me. Mm-hmm. That's what racism is about. That's what xenophobia is about. That's what Islamophobia is about. That's what anti-Semitism is about. Hmm. Wow. You're not, it's not about being different. Because if you're perceived to be stronger or smarter or richer or more powerful, you might be disliked, but you're not going to be treated badly. You know what I'm saying? So it's not as a result of you're just different. It's as, as a result of you're less. Mm-hmm. You're less yeah. than me. Mm-hmm. Right. You know? and, and But you actually, I mean, it takes, it takes guts to give up engineering and consulting career and actually make that move. So we're, what was that moment like? So not, not to put down anybody in, in those career paths because these people 
still do great things and they fund our organization. We need them there. Say, they're, 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 <laughs> right? They are it's, your benefactors. Exactly. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, you know, care in every organization is a bird of two wings. They're, they're, right. they're those who, you know, put their lives into service and those who fund them, right? Yeah. But for me, it wasn't satisfying. And I looked at the top of the hill and the first year I did great. And I remember my manager telling me, we're giving out the raises, you're getting, you know, the highest raise of your class, your freshman class at this company. And this is a big company. Mm -hmm. And if you continue to do what you're doing without getting complacent, and this is the first time I looked up the word complacent. That's why I remember, <laughs> that's why I remember this. <laughs> he said, uh, you could be CEO one day. I'm like, wow, okay, that's great. And that's exactly when I got complacent. Because <laughs> I looked at the top of the hill and it wasn't good enough for me. It wasn't something that I thought satisfying. I was satisfying. It wasn't satisfying. It, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It wasn't fulfilling. fulfilling. It wasn't satisfying. It wasn't gratifying. And I looked at the top and I'm like, okay, let's say I do this for 30 years and I'm up there and I'm making a rich company richer uh, whose services I don't particularly care for. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're serving banks and companies and doing accounting. And I live once. I'm going to have to make a sacrifice. I won't be as richer. I won't be as economically, you know, uh, comfortable. But at least I want to live my life, this one chance I have, doing what I think I might like doing and, and what is worth living for. And I'm thinking yeah. about the prom story. It's yes. The, it's the same yes. mentality, right? It's the right? same mentality. Yeah. yeah. So at the time though, and again, like I said, life is sloppy and you don't have everything figured out and anybody who tells you otherwise is, is lying. Um, I left it there and oh. I just I just kind of like wasn't a great performing employee, right. but I didn't have an alternative. Mm-hmm. So there was always a part that's left to fate. And so at some point, a friend of mine from college who ended up going to law school, Yasser Tabata, he was asked by mm. the board of Care Chicago. When I say I co-founded Care Chicago, I'll explain that in a second, because mm -hmm. it existed. Yeah. But it existed as an idea that never materialized. So before you go there, though, for the sake of our listeners, and, and I think to my knowledge, I, my memory might be at the best, but I don't think we've actually done, this by no means has to be a deep dive, but the history of the organization. Yeah. So for one, the care predates 9-11. I don't want to give that impression that this was formed after 9-11. Dr. Nihadawad, I think in the mid-90s is, is what my memory is. Yes. So if you could, whatever. Yeah, no, you're right. Yeah. So CARE existed yeah. uh, since 1994. It was founded as a national organization in D.C. and uh, to a degree in California. So you guys have one of the oldest chapters in L.A., because oh, one, one of the founders, Omar Ahmed, was from L.A. Oh, yeah, Omar and the other Ahmed. two right. were from Minnesota. Ibrahim yeah. Hooper and, and, and Nihad Awad. Yeah. Yeah. I think Omar Ahmed was in the Bay Area. That's correct. When I moved to the Bay Area. That's correct. And, and he's listed often as, as the founder. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then he brought along, you know, partners into it. But whatever the history was, and I never really particularly cared for the... Islamophobes cared more than I did, honestly. <laughs> I so, you know, they have all these stories and myths about how it started and yeah. who it was affiliated with. But that anyway... These individuals, they put together this this organization, and um, it was headquartered in D.C., and it was around for 10 years when, when I started here. So this was 1994 when it began, right. the year I graduated high school. And and I remember early on, I came, you know, at one of the ISNA conventions, um, yeah. I came close to care by saying, I knew I was a good writer. Uh, I was a terrible speaker. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't have any public speaking background. But I was a good writer. So I went over to uh, Ibrahim Hooper at his booth uh, at ISNA. Yeah. And I said, hey, man, I'm a good writer. I want to volunteer with you guys. Right. And he said, oh, you got to start at the bottom of the ladder, you know, fold these shirts. I'm like, all right, I'm out of here. Goodbye. <laughs> Never look back. <laughs> he lost himself this is a volunteer. What, like, uh, this is probably 1995, seven? 96. It was okay, like they were only okay, a couple, okay. couple of years into it. So many years later, obviously, we started working together and it was a whole different ball game. But, sure. but at the time, you know, I was like, no, I wanted to write and, mm -hmm. and I need you. To, and, and by the way, this story informed how we created our internship program here. To take our interns super seriously and to give them actual work to do. Right. You know, they're not brewing coffee or, or, or you know, Xeroxing or you know, folding shirts stuff or folding shirts. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so. 2004 uh, is when I joined uh, basically the resurgence, the rebirth of Care Chicago. So it was around since 2002. And during those two years, they had hired and fired like five executive directors. And the organization did not only here in Chicago have a neutral reputation, had a negative one. So coming into it, I wasn't coming into ground zero. I was coming into underground. Ne negative. Negative. So when I say we co-founded, and it's not just myself, but it's Yasser Tabara, president who was there all along at the time, uh, Safa Zarzur. So the three of us put our heads together and kind of 
produced a new I, way of doing things. And alhamdulillah, it worked. And, and the first thing we did was we had this phase called incubation phase, where for six months we did not show up anywhere and people were like, oh, here we go again. But when we came out at the end of those four, four or five months, we came out with a bang that never fizzled. You know, we had the website. It's one of the first organizational websites to be created. We had the full plan. We had the, the talking points, the rhetoric, the feel to it. I mean, it was a very passionate appeal of young men who were out on those pulpits and it was noticed and it immediately had an impact. And, mm-hmm, it, you know, mm-hmm. we never looked back, alhamdulillah. So I, I'd be remiss, though, if, if we didn't also, and, and this might take us a little step back, but it may also inform the work that you do and the passion you had when you first got involved. And that would be to talk about your mentor. I, I think, is it during undergrad that you encounter yeah. Dr. Sharif Basuni, rahimullah? Yeah, so again, let, let's go back a little bit, uh, yeah. and I'll get to that right away. But I always had a sense of uh, personal failure when it came to certain aspects of my personality. Like I felt like I was just never going to cross that barrier. And one of them was public speaking. I was a very shy, meek person. Part of it was informed by my experiences in this high school, um, you know, losing, um, uh, losing, what, what do they call that? Uh, confidence, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so I thought it was something I'd never, I would never get over ever. So I said, you know what, that's fine. You know, when you can't face a hill, what do you do? You just convince yourself it's not worth facing. <laughs> I'm a good writer. Writing lasts longer. I write myself a few good books and who cares about public speaking? It's overrated anyway. But at the same time, part of me, you know, I always challenged myself. I just wanted to do it. I wanted to learn it. And so in, in college, I admired those who could do it and looked up to them greatly. And they were always a guiding light for me. And one of them was Junid Hassan, who gave amazing khutbas <laughs> at UIC. Another was Altaf Kaisruddin, who was a medical student. Another was Hisham Hasaballah, who was a medical student. And a third um, is, is somebody that you guys wouldn't know. Uh, he was somebody visiting from Saudi Arabia, an Egyptian uh, by the name of Muhammad. Anyway, those four guys, I'd hear them give speeches. I'm like, I wish I could do that. Anyway, fast forward, and, and now we're uh, talking about college years, late college years, grad school. And I come across Shreve Basuni. Shreve Basuni, I read his name, I read his story in a pamphlet at UIC, at DePaul, where I was doing my master's degree in software engineering. And I realized he's Egyptian, but this guy, he's a man of the world. I mean, he speaks nine languages fluently. He's the president of three international human rights law institutes. He is the author of 70 books. He's been around the world. He speaks everywhere. Um, He's decorated. He has, I think, three or four honorary citizenships that were given to him by kings and queens and presidents of countries. So a walking legend who happens to be originally Egyptian, a Muslim guy down down a block from me, even a building from me. So I muster up the courage. I walk up into DePaul Law School where his office was housed. I walk through all the maze of little, you know, assistant desks that he has outside and I knock on his big door and he opens up. And I remember the first meeting. He was very hospitable, very nice for a man of his stature as a complete nobody. And software engineer, not even a law student, right? He wasn't used to getting people like that into his office. He would get law students who were wide-eyed and wanted to, you know, ask him legal questions. Mm -hmm. And I just hit it off with him, you know, very, very calmly. We spoke about his background, almost a mini interview. Became good friends, and this lasted for the entirety of our lives. It kept getting deeper and stronger and more passionate. And there were other friends of mine who had the same relationship. And together we formed sort of a little cohort, you know, and he was sort of the guru that would give us advice and sometimes would push back. But yeah, I mean, his, uh, his, his desk now is the desk that I work on. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. And the plaque behind that desk, which was of certain fame, rests on the wall in my, in my office, mm. as does his legacy. You know, it's yes. between these walls. Speaking of legacy, he was actually featured in that uh, in that documentary, Muhammad: Legacy of a Prophet. I remember he, he was, was one of the, yeah, yeah many many documentaries. And, yeah, um, he was featured in many interviews. I just remember that for me at least that was the, I think the first time I had came to yes, know of him, yes. and then I started following his writings. And yeah. <clears throat> as a as a law student, had a huge impact on me <clears throat> reading good. his journal and you know his uh, journal articles mm-hmm. on but Islamic you, law. But you're right about Islamic law. You're right to sort of mention his name in yeah. this conversation because. You know, I, I often wonder, like, what is it about going back to, well, not going back, speaking of soccer, which we were, you know, chatting about before uh, we started here. I always wondered, you know, soccer is not like football, right? It's not, it's not something that can be ingrained in your DNA. It's not, it's not a genetic thing. It's an acquired thing, right? Like, so why is it the Brazilians are consistently good at it versus, I don't know, Canadians? So there's something to be said about this thing that acts like it's 
a DNA, th- a genetic thing, but it's not. And my response to that phenomenon, sort of the, the X factor, is having someone from that culture show that it's possible early on, because it's an acquired thing. And so culturally, it becomes attainable for so many people, and now they can see that they can do it. You know, the Japanese with technology, um, Americans with startups, the Brazilians with football. You know, Egyptians with, with something as strange as squash, which is uh, racquetball. I mean, we're, we get all the you know, awards in that particular sport. Why that sport? It's not because we spend more money on it than others. I mean, that's, that would be an obvious answer. But because we had a couple of guys back in the day win it all, judo or whatever else, uh, other sport, you'll find these countries that have these sort of niche mm-hmm. sports yeah, and they're yeah. consistently good at wrestling in, in Armenia or Turkey, you know, versus mm-hmm. other things. Somebody did it early. And others who look like that person said, so can I. Mm. Shri Basini was that guy for me. You know? Hmm. You see in the Jewish community a lot of success stories. It goes to their mentors, yeah, right? In, yeah. in Hollywood, for example. Great oh, point. you know, Hollywood is dominated by Jews. Well, it was the same phenomenon. It's more than domination or a, some kind of um, uh, conspiracy. conspiracy. It right. was that certain individuals started, you know, in this arena early on. And many others who look like them said, I can do it too. So I remember seeing Shri Basuni give these speeches. I remember seeing him have these cameras in his office and he just kind of loosens his tie and sits back and talks with me. And then a second later, he's tightening the tie and he's doing the interview. Mm -hmm. And that became me many years later in part because I saw that someone who looks like me could make it happen. I'm Hmm. connecting the dots between your experiences here and, you know, you talk about leaving engineering to go work for something that you felt was more satisfying where you could maybe have a bigger impact and I'm also mm-hmm. connecting the dot because you saw somebody who had an impact mm-hmm. through leadership, through change, through charisma, whatever it was, through knowledge, and change an entire subculture. Absolutely. And that is the power of mentorship. And again, it's important peer-to-peer. And that's why I picked out guys like Junaid Hassan to, to look up to because you are going to be who you surround yourself with. I mean, you will... You know, if you're around guys who do weed and sit all day and just listen to music and, you know, shoot the whatever and, and, and don't get anywhere, you got to be that guy. And mm-hmm. if you seek out people who you think are better than you in some ways and you want to aspire to be like them, you will grow that way. And likewise with larger than life figures, I mean, whether it's peer to peer or larger than life. And I say this and I'll close the point with that is we need these role models in our lives. We need, we need them for our children, for our youth, right? For our yeah. Muslim community to grow. So it's just a sidebar. Do you think our Muslim youth have enough ro- of these types of role models right now? No, <laughs> I don't. Well, that's mm. going to lead to a conversation I know we want to have yeah. about about role models, specifically, I think, for role models for some of our young men in our community. But uh, before we get there, though, I, I would like for you to kind of pick up where I, you know, I, I brought you back uh, talking about your mentor, but the early days of the care office mm. here in Chicago. Yeah. That period yeah. is a story that needs to be told at some point in some detail, but it, it wasn't easy. Like I said, it was an uphill battle, first with our community. Okay. Because and and by, by way of context, we're talking like 04 right now? We're talking 04. Okay. Okay. Why, so so, this is, why, in our, why from our community? I'm just curious. Be, well, because what I mentioned earlier about this attempt at building this you know, Care Chicago that, that failed miserably five times, five different okay. directors. So by yeah. that time, you know, um, the, the people were like, okay, here we go again. Yeah. You know, there was money that was raised that didn't really build much in terms of, of, of the organization. I remember getting people just, you know, cold call people and be like, ah, okay, we'll call you back and they never do. Early it, on, and it was leaders. just a personnel issue. It wasn't the lack of need or anything. It was, it was, it, it was just a personnel yeah, issue. Yeah, really. in our experience, yeah. it was. So that, and we're talking about Care Chicago specific experience. So that was pretty unique to our experience in Chicago that there were these attempts that didn't go far. And so we were just at the tail end of that mm-hmm. and people assumed it was just another iteration. But that quickly changed in the way I described with the incubation phase. Here's what I wanted to do. And this is important to say. It wasn't just about civil rights. It wasn't just about Muslims. That was half of what I was interested in. The other half was cultural competence, organizational competence, mm-hmm. corporate competence, uh, whatever you yeah. want to call it. So I had this idea in my mind that it would be shameful. It's a shame to have companies like Coca-Cola or Motorola or Arthur Anderson, whatever it is, these so-called secular companies that sell products or services um, just to make more money for rich people, make them richer, to have these great logos and beautiful websites and no dead links and they're updated regularly and to have nice pristine looking offices and professional staff who are paid well and nice desks and computers and know how to talk. And then for those who 
proclaim to speak for the greatest product and service of all, Islam, you know, the, the peace mm -hmm. and healing and, you know, divine, you know, revelation, to be the people whose bathrooms are filled with water and <laughs> tissue paper and, and then to walk into their offices and it's half green, half yellow, and there's a half a carpet and there's, you know, hardwood floor and an old oh, desk true. and, you know, volunteers who don't yeah. get paid. And, right. But then they say, Salaam Alaikum, and then they say, MashaAllah, and then yeah. suddenly that's supposed to be Islam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I was yeah, offended by so that. So true. Yeah. It's I, th I think a lot of people listening are going to be like, that's a little too real. <laughs> you know, Pervis, <laughs> Pervis, <laughs> Pervis, no, we were speaking of their experience. <laughs> we were just talking about the muscle that is needed to help take organizations to maybe a next level. And some of these muscles that you need in kind of modern organizations is primarily developed or most effectively developed sometimes in a corporate environment. Yeah. And I think yeah. possibly you're yeah. likely your consulting experience because consultants, consulting is right. a very hard job. Uh, yeah. You have to come in and actually tell these Fortune 500 companies how to do it even better. <laughs> yes. So um, I presume that muscle that you developed in that, in that experience. Uh, it's a big uh, part of it. Applied. And I always believe that God puts you on a path. And, and so I sometimes wondered what was that you know period for. And I guess it was for this, for me mm. to, to. But the other part of it, and this was, goes back to Professor's question earlier about you know my personal family's religious sensibilities. And part of it was aesthetics. Like it was a big part of our, our family values. And so me and my two sisters, you know, we would decorate our rooms a certain way and we would have these sort of decoration, you know, competitions, of, you know, and, and we had to create moods and vibes and it, it mattered. It didn't just exist in physical space, just, be, you know, just randomly. So, and I made no, I wasn't ashamed to talk about that point. I made it very clearly Complete. to the community, right. to my peers. I said, you want to be a good Muslim? Look nice, dress nice. Um, have a nice looking office, have a nice looking website, make sure you're, I don't want to see, I used to say this all the time, I don't want to see these printouts where the, you know, the, the sentences are going to going up or going down and it can't even be printed, you know, properly in the middle of a, of, of a piece of paper. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't happen anymore. But back then there was a lot of this weird printing, you know, this Zaki with your cartoons and mm -hmm. things that, you know, so we had this attitude of like, well, you know, it's for the sake of Allah. So whatever you do is fine, is good enough. And it doesn't really matter. So true. You know, your intentions are all that matter. No, intentions and performance. Yeah. Let, let, can, mm. can, we, can we work on both? Does Her, it have to be one or yeah. the other? Herbez, I, I know you're nodding. Uh, oh, I can't. Because <laughs> we, we talk a lot about the aesthetic. Yeah. Right? And your office was, honestly, mashallah, really beautiful. Thank you. Like, you Thank put you. your personal yeah. touch in it. Like, I appreciated yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and just, the, yeah, I mean, like, the, the, all of the offices here. This entire here, yeah, yeah. facility. Facility amazing. really is. And, and, you can see, and you can see it. I mean, I walked in and you can see the attention to detail. I mean, I felt like I was walking into the offices of a white shoe law firm in downtown Chicago. You can, dare I say, you can f see the care <laughs> put into it. Thank you. No, it's, you know, it's, I have a little sound effect. <laughs> yeah, I know. The drum. The drum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you, you know, just one thing I did want to say about, you know, you talk about public speaking and um, the, the specific role. I mean, I, I can speak to that directly because I've been teaching public speaking for, for uh, almost 20 years now. And it is something that, and you can attest to this. Right? I mean, it, it, that's people's entree into you as a person oftentimes. And it's a skill. It's, it's, it's a soft skill that is deeply undervalued, I think, in society at large. But especially in the Muslim community, I feel like we, we don't foreground that as a skill. It's what makes the president of the United States the most powerful position on earth. Hmm. The president of the United States. Wow. Except for Bush. That was an, <laughs> that was an exception. But, but normally, I think it's not, people don't look at your resume when you're running for office that much. You know, right now, Vivek um, yeah. Ramaswamy, I think his name is. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, he's, he's, he's starting to climb up the polls. Mm -hmm. It's not because of anything, but the way he is communicating his communications communication abilities mm -hmm. even with trump quite frankly i mean mm -hmm. he's a guy who came you know love him or hate him and i know most people hate him but he came from almost nowhere politically and he succeeded because he's not particularly eloquent but he communicated clearly emotional clarity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as part of good communication he had that and he was able to pip a lot of lifetime career politicians including especially including the uh, Republican primary the entire Bush family yeah. was swept aside and this this is something that we kind of like gloss over but this this is a big deal i mean these guys could no, do no wrong at that point in time absolutely jeb was the heir apparent it was Jeb, and yeah. it was uh, the, you know uh, the father and the son. Yeah, <laughs> it was well, everybody. Yeah, yeah, he it was did. The whole family it, it, it was even right. Barbara Bush, yeah. and they were just canceled. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it was because Trump's ability to debate uh, and communicate a certain way. He even said things about the Iraq war that nobody other than Muslims uh, were, were, had ever said and got away with it. That's right. And not even just got away with it. He actually got to the top of that Republican hill with that in tow. Mm-hmm. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. So the point here is, yes, public speaking communication is so key. Communication in general. I mean, public speaking is a subset of that. But being able to communicate ideas from your heart and mind into your tongue or your pen into the uh, ether is a power. And I had to come to terms with that. Hmm. Having tried to sidestep this public speaking thing, and I mentioned that earlier, but what happened was (laughs) I took a cold plunge. It was one of those things where I went from I don't want to say 100, but zero to, you know, a pretty high point very fast, almost overnight. And in my case, all it took was um, dropping the fear. Interesting. It wasn't about getting trained into it. I guess you had it all along and you just, you know, the fear was was masking it. So the moment I stopped caring and, and the moment I did it, the reason I did is when I saw Islamophobes go out there and speak eloquently and clearly and boldly, I'm like, okay, so these guys are going to go out there and lie and trash my community. And I'm the guy who's going to worry about what people think of me Hmm. or my voice or my accent or how I talk or what words I choose. I'm like, the hell with that. So (laughs) drop that fear. It was almost overnight. You know, I was doing the public speaking, the press conferences. And from a guy who wouldn't even answer the word yes in a classroom, right, to a question, that was yes or no (laughs) question, to going and debating Bill O'Reilly on Fox News in front of millions, this is not friendly territory. Hmm. It was from here to that in, in, in one stride. Right. Well, and alhamdulillah, did, did quite well and started to be known in the community as the guy that you want on right wing media. Yeah. Well, I mean, can you, I mean, framing this conversation in that way, I mean, you talked about where you started at Karen. I mean, you've been with the organization a long time. Talk about from there to now what your, uh, what your portfolio is and, yeah. and um, what, what you feel like you've accomplished. So uh, let me first state very clearly that it, it took a village indeed. I mean, it mm-hmm. took a lot of hard work from a lot of different people. You know, I'm only a small part of that story, but here I am speaking about my story. So uh, I just want to put that caveat out there. But basically, so the early challenge was to get the community on board. And we talked a little bit about that. So once we did, and alhamdulillah, they did. And, and we went from people, you know, shutting doors and hanging up phones to excitement in the community about these young people who were involved in this new organization with the good aesthetics, with a good website, with a nice office. We've always had a nice office. This is our seventh office. Every one of them was designed and looked you know, good from the very beginning. So this was our culture from the very beginning. We had about 12 values that we listed on our website that included transparency, competence, whatever it is, you can still see them. We live by them to this day. So these were our guiding values. And so once we had the community on board, now we had to climb from underground to ground zero with the public because there, Islamophobia was running amok. And again, if you're looking at today and trying to project back to understand those times, they have little in common. Back then, it was super cool, super easy to trash Islam and Muslims at the slightest behest on the top platforms in the country. And we're not just talking Fox News. Fox. It could be SNL. It mm. could be Bill Maher on HBO. It could be Don Lemon on CNN. It could be um, MSNBC even, to a degree. It could be anywhere, movies, New York Times. Movies and television, of course. Absolutely. And that started even earlier than, yeah. than post 9 11. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, left wing or, or, you know, lefty, you know, Islamophobia in Hollywood precedes, you know, the Islamophobia we saw post 9 11 from the right. And by these decades. are conversations yes. I feel like you and I had back in the day about yes. things, about the, the prevalence of this in films. Yes. Because like back yeah. then, that was the space in which, you know, we saw Islamophobia play out the most. Oh, yeah. for sure. You know, it wasn't really sure. popular in politics until after 9-11 and then all of the, you know, snake oil salesmen who wanted to piggyback on this event and, mm-hmm. and further the, their political careers created the new enemy that is Islam. You know, they were looking for one post-Soviet Union collapse. Hmm. And it was hard to come by, you know, the next lumbering giant that Rocky Balboa could knock out. You know, you, you got to build them up to take them down. You know, that's that's the story of every American movie. And so we became that guy. We that's became right. that, that nemesis. I mean, it was concocted. It wasn't natural. This wasn't the Soviet Union. This wasn't Nazi Germany. I mean, Al-Qaeda, these ragtag bunch of you know, Kate. morons who are essentially on the outskirts of Islam itself, hmm. let alone Western yeah. society, right. were not your Nazis or Soviet Union. So in this case, it was a complete paper tiger, but it was built up with such savage commitment that 
they had to continue the narrative daily. It had to be daily headlines because the moment you let off, it just fizzles, it just falls apart. It's not self-sustaining. So I remember headlines like, is Islam a violent religion? They would debate that question on national television, on CNN, not Fox News. Right. And you were meant, you were, you were required and asked to come up, show up and respond to an asinine question, a dumb question like that, that cannot even be answered. Wow. And then you have Christians on the other side of all people, you know, with the history of slavery and colonialism and, and mercantilism and you name it, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it, whole humans, races of humans were wiped out. Tasmania, you know, the, the, I visited Tasmania in, in Australia, an entire island of human beings, a whole subspecies of humans wiped out, not even because they wanted the resources, but for sport. They were hunted like rabbits by prim and proper, you know, gentlemen and ladies who are sitting on the backs of horses with, with white gloves and their pinky would stick out when, when they drink their cup of tea and they were so civilized and polished. Mm. And that's the civilization that wants to now look at Islam and say, wag a finger, you savages, what mm. are you doing? And they're talking about our outlaws. They're not talking about our mainstream. That was their mainstream. Mm. Now, I'm not one to hold grudges. I'm not one to define people by their worst examples, but you're going to play that game. I'm going to play it back and it's going to hurt. <laughs> so... You know, I'm, I'm happy to let bygones be bygones, but don't come at me and start wagging fingers because yeah. two can play that game. Like yeah. I said, this is not our mainstream. That's the Chicago way. <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> to quote, to quote another movie. You know, we've got to whack some kneecaps, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, seriously, I mean this, but this is the spirit I brought to every interview. Like I never wanted to be, you know, apologetic. And that's what I try to teach culturally into our community and into our organization sure. is that we don't want to come from a place of weakness and a place of defense. You know, I, I don't want to answer your questions like you have a right to ask them and I'm, hmm. I have to answer them. If they're dumb questions, I'll let you know your frame is dumb. Try again. If it's a decent question, maybe I'll give you, you know, the benefit mm -hmm. of the doubt and, right. and give you a proper answer. But, but that was the challenge we had and that was the world we lived in. And part of that sort of attitude that we brought uh, to the table I think that was part of the story. And of course, there was a lot of work that needed to be done just to answer your question, Zachy. I mean, we had to build blogs, some of them anonymous, some of them public, um, that had you know hundreds of thousands of views to, to pinpoint and tackle every single lie narrative that was spun on the blogosphere, because we mm -hmm. identified that that's where most of the Islamophobic narratives began. Wow. They would begin there, they would fester there, they would seep into AM radio, XM radio, whatever it was, and from there into right-wing media like Fox News, and then from there into CNN and Washington Post. And that was always the cycle. And then into the policy halls of DC. But it always began in those dark annals of, of the internet. And for example, the Sharia scare, if you recall that, this whole jihad BS that we talked about all the time, this whole is Islam violent, does Islam hate us, it all began there. Newsmax or Front Page Mag or Muslim, what was it, Islam Monitor, or Militant World, Islam Monitor. World News Daily. World News Daily and yeah. even, you know, Robert Spencer and Pamela no. Geller. I mean, these losers had capital, uh, what's the, uh, cultural types. capital. Yeah, Daniel Pipes. Kaufman, Steve Emerson. Daniel Pipes, Steve Emerson, all these, yeah, names, all these kind of names that meant a lot to us at the time. I mean, yeah. we were studying these personalities no, right. and the work, yeah. but we essentially slayed them. Yeah. Proverbially, right. alhamdulillah. No, no, you're right. You know, put them to bed, put them out, and and now we don't look back. And they're trying now. They're tr I'm like, dude, you're done. We're done. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as, <laughs> yeah, as, you were, as you were going naming those names, I'm like, thank God. Actually, those folks' names are kind of. But they the had past. their no, day. They had their day in the sun. And I remember of, dustbin of history is where they are now. They are now. Yeah, yeah, but but yeah, at the no, time, no, no, at the time, that you didn't was know it. Not right. and, and trust me, I mean, the, the, uh, professors of Islam. Okay, would be afraid to risk because I went to the professor. So look, you guys are the academics. Yeah. These guys are saying this is what normative Islam is. It's your job to teach what normative Islam is, and to point out what's aberrational. Why are you so silent? And a lot of them said, "Look, we can't handle this. We're not. We're not cut out for this. Hmm. We we write our papers. They're read in a essentially an ivory ivory tower of other students and academics. We don't want to play this mudslinging game publicly because the moment you respond to these guys, they were, they designed their whole thing to dox you and and, and scare you and you know, find a story about you personally, and you're not an actual celebrity. You're not, you know, you're not used to being, you know, outed in your private details. You went to this trip, you met this person, you had this comment that you made when you were a teenager. They would play that game oh, and you, scare everybody into silence. You happen to share the stage with someone at a yes. convention. Yes. You know, and you were. But there wasn't there, there a was sort a hit of, piece. 
out. But every, everybody played along. Yeah. Like, no, you're fear right. was the name of the game. So instead of going, what the hell are you doing? This is dumb. People would be like, oh, no, I didn't say that. No, no, I was 17. No, what are you talking about? Mm-hmm. No, but I was there, but I didn't actually agree. So everybody was playing this. Right. That was the nature of the pressure. Right. And, and they framed the discussion. Right. And, and so and we had to respond. the best you could do, this is the world we walked in. The best people could do was to try to weasel their way out of an accusation. That's not the game we played, though. So we changed the rules of the game. We Love said, it. no, we're going to make fun of your questions, your angle. We're not going to apologize for anything, you know, unless we actually are, are a problem. When, when we're not, we're not going to. And instead, we're going to play attack. And so we did we did attack on them, counterattack on them. A yeah. lot of the blogs we created um, would attack them on the merit of the narrative or like thereof yeah. in this instance. Right. We weren't attacking the way they attacked. You know, we would just diffuse and sort of, you know, disassemble their, their narratives and arguments and, and, and make fun of it in the process and make it, f- make people, the public feel like that's okay. And the more people like, oh, these guys are being slapped around, they became less important. And mm-hmm. eventually they wouldn't even be invited on, on right wing radio. Alhamdulillah. I mean, that was one of the successes. When was the that? Do, when do you think, uh, those folks were kind of put to bed. Was that around 2011, oh, 12? It was, you know, funnily enough, it was, um, it took all the way to the Trump era. And part of the reason why the Trump era mattered to this is that finally those on the left found cause to support Muslims against Islamophobia. Huh, it doesn't yeah. go earlier than that. Right. Wow. To a degree. Yeah. Talk so, about a silver lining, right? Yes, but that was well. May yeah. our, our, you know, yeah. I, I we think were that's embraced. up for debate. The embrace, yes, okay, was yeah. in the Trump years. I'm saying it's up for debate whether or not that was a silver, a silver lining. Oh yeah, because, okay, because yeah, but I mean, we've already talked about the sort of you know two faced nature sometimes of the embrace of, of the white liberal embrace. Well, well that's true, but yeah. the timeline is important here because right. a lot of times you know our, our, our friends on the left they try to kind of act like they were always there. Yeah, I'm like, what mm, I mean. no, right. not really. I right. mean, you came strongly after the Muslim ban. You came strongly when Trump, who to you was as much an enemy as he is to, to us or to anyone, was a common factor. That's what it was. But before that, I mean, I remember the Dubai world ports and mm-hmm. it was the Democrats who led that thing. Yep. We can't have Muslims be, you know, mm-hmm. securing our ports. Right. You know, Muslims were not the problem, were they? It was, it was Al-Qaeda. So this conflation of Islam and terrorism was a common thing on the left and the right That's forever. Nice. The Muslim ban was a, definitely a pivotal moment though, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So maybe you can talk a little about like, how did things change then for, for the organization? Because I think that does mark like kind of a real shift. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But for me, not as much. I mean- it, Not the Trump ban. I mean, I'm sorry, not the travel ban specifically, but I think the Trump era. Yeah, I mean, to a degree. But again, yeah. here's the thing. Uh-huh. Like, if, you, if you've run a marathon, mm-hmm. right, and you've run through the thickest parts of it, the hardest parts of it with zero, with little support, and then you get to towards the end, and then you get a couple of, you know, guys kind of, mm. it's like, thank you, but it, it's kind of too little too late. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to seem ungrateful, but yeah. we survived. We, we fought the tough part of the post-9-11 years without many allies. Oh, I agree with that. I, you know? Yeah, yeah. I so to me, that. having, for, for people who started their activism in those years, probably it's a pivotal moment. For mm-hmm. me, someone who's a bit older, a bit of veteran of this game, yeah. I'm like, yeah, it's a good moment, but it's not a pivotal moment. I remember when Senator Barbara Boxer would disinvite, and she's a Democratic senator. Yeah. Um, one of our colleagues, I won't, I won't name anybody, uh, from an award that he received on merit because some loser in some basement in Florida would, would send her a fax or an email saying this guy was, you know, I remember that. a terrorist uh, sympathizer. Yes, I remember Joe that. Joe Kaufman. Yeah. And uh, so, and, and she was, you know, it, it was easy for her to say, this is crap, I'm not doing it. Yeah, yeah. But they would always take the easy way, right. Right? right? It wasn't until later when it became politically important for them, they realized the power of the white supremacist crowds and yeah. the resurgence of the right post tea party etc that they wanted to broaden the coalition yes and the common enemies etc and so it became a self-serving self-interest to a degree and i'm fine with that I mean, i'm not an idealistic yeah, yeah. person okay. but i'm not going to sit and look at this moment and go oh it's defining or it was there all along sure if we could turn our focus because i think you've talked extensively about what the muslim community was facing from the outside if you will but I, you know, I'd love for you to 
turn your very astute analysis to what was happening within the Muslim mm. community. Oh, well. Right? The Trump, so. I mean, because we, we talk about the rise of Trump, but I think we, we, we have to talk about what is occurring and what is happening in the Obama era. Yeah. Where Muslims, as a response almost, uh, or certainly like the, sh the pendulum shift due to the policies of the Bush administration, mm -hmm. go hook, line, and sinker <laughs> by the uh, Democratic Liberal Party line. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's and evolving, embrace... right? That's evolving yeah. right now. Or devolving. Now it is. No, 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 now it is. I'm, I'm, I, but I, I, I'm asking you to sort of mm. talk about that evolution yeah. and get us to where we are today, because I think that is going to inform some of the issues that I'd love to sort of discuss with you. Because yeah. by and large, that's what happened with the community. Right. Mm -hmm. Because so, I think, you know, and you're enough of a, a like an observer to know that in the 80s, I would even argue, you know, uh, up until the, you know, 2000 election, Muslims were, it wasn't, unlo it, it wasn't uncommon for Muslims to vote public right. because of various issues. It wasn't even uncommon for Muslims to not vote at all. Oh, well, of course. You know what I mean? But so, I mean let's, yeah. Yeah. But, but I hear your point loud yeah, and clear. Yeah. And, but, but I say this to say this. No, no, it, that's a good point. So, so our Muslim community, again, when we're talking about the Muslim, th th there are communities, yeah. Right. So really you can only talk about Muslim communities. But if we were to sure, approximate sure, the, commu sure, sure. the communities Good into point. a community, I would say it's it's the organized, again, the yeah. mosque building, yeah. the convention going, the MSA attending type of community, Thank which you. is not the entire Muslim community. I know. But it's means. enough of a thing to talk about. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that. Yeah. That community, self identifying religious mosque going community. Um, again, was culturally informed by certain movements and certain outlooks. And we talked about that earlier, and I kinda wanna piggyback on that conversation to say that as these people got older and became more ingrained in American life, they massaged and changed and altered some of their thinking and some of their ways. And then their children more so and their grandchildren more and more so. So let's just, to finish that thought, there has been a massive evolution from these origins because I don't want to leave it there and people think, okay, this is who the Muslim community is and that's it. There is a natural evolution into the American spaces as a result of just living here and interacting with different ideas Absolutely. and cultures. And so today what you have is a truly a true departure from these origins into a lot of different corners. They still it still exists, you know, maybe as the mainstream of certain organizations and, and movements, but but generally you've seen this diversity. Now right. put that on one one shelf. Let's go back to maybe pre-Bush. Pre-Bush, that religious community was conservative. Yes. Socially. Socially. And culturally. So they felt that probably the Republican Party more was aligned. more attuned to their sensibilities. Aligned with their... Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would say even at, you know, I think it was 2000, yeah, 2000, uh, the Bush, the first Bush um, uh, election. Bush Lieberman. Bush Lieberman. Yep. And Lieberman was a big deal. Yeah. Yeah, it was a big deal. Lieberman was, a, I mean, it, was it was Al Gore Lieberman, but yeah, but Lieberman was. But Lieberman was the one who was. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, it was Al Gore. Yeah, yeah. That's but, right. That's but, right. Exactly. Bush thought, and Lieberman mattered. That's I thought, right. I thought you said Lieberman intentionally. Yeah. No, no, I did. Yeah. I did. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah, okay. For some reason, I was correlating no. Lieberman with Bush instead of Al Gore. Well, they, they are correlated. Oh, I, I remember, yeah. and I've said this before, I, sitting in a Friday clip, but here in the Chicagoland area where the mom said, if you don't vote for Bush, you have to answer to Allah. Yeah. All right. Part of it was not expertise on Bush's policies. Part of it was a reaction to Lieberman. Yeah. But it wasn't Lieberman being Jewish. It was Lieberman being a flaming Zionist mm -hmm. who was happy to say he didn't give a rat's you know what about yeah. Palestinian life, et cetera. Now, again, this tells Con you where the community was. Conversely, though, the Bush, uh, you know, on, on the Bush side, the position they took on secret evidence at that time with the Al Arian case yeah. and things like that, I think that was, that. The, I think to me, at least in my assessment, more 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 than just the Lieberman effect, it was, it was I think, what Bush did proactively. To, yes, I mean, sure, to, sure. I mean, Bush was seen as sort of uh, the challenger to that world, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, it was Bill Clinton and his yeah. very sloppy bombing of Sudan right. that yeah. resonated with Muslims yeah. as, as a horrible act. Yeah, remember that? Like it was like the wag, yeah, wag the dog. It was like, like the dog. Yeah, Monica dog. Lewinsky was That's happening. He wanted right. to change yeah. the headlines, so he goes and bombs. I think it was a pharmaceutical company exactly in Sudan, yes. and people died. And he goes, "Oh, I'm right. sorry." And yeah. That stuff was happening, and certain you know persecutions and prosecutions of certain right, Muslims yeah. here. Yeah, but I right. think Lieberman had a big part to do with it, and generally 
the notion that the Republicans were the more folksy, traditional, For family-oriented, sure. Sure there was conservative that. types, right? Mm -hmm. Which which isn't untrue to a degree. There were also the Islamophobic, you know, yeah. racist, you know, yeah. white supremacist types in many ways. For sure. Both were true. But we didn't look to that second part True. until it hit And us arguably, face. especially if we're talking about the immigrant community or the um, first generation community in America, it, it, you know, they were also financially successful. There was the, there was a financial element too in terms of why right. the GOP yeah. was the more right. safer so choice yeah. for a lot of Muslims. Right. In and, addition and, and, to the social conservatism. Absolutely. Yeah. And we didn't have organizations or leaders uh, or thinkers who are well versed in politics the way we do today at all none of our none of the organizations working in you know voting and get out the vote and really existed at the time you're right uh, you know and the ones that did weren't they were sort of lackadaisical on these issues. It yeah. wasn't, you know, I remember going to ISNA conventions. Mm -hmm. This isn't about ISNA, it's about the crowds. And you would walk around the halls and you'd talk to people. And the big debate there was, is voting halal or haram. No, you're right. Especially That, that was the, the extent of our political involvement, is, that, is debating whether voting is halal or haram, it, whether music was halal or haram. I remember having these debates and they would take up half the time at the ISNA convention. Nobody has these debates today. You're right. So... There was a shift from there, and again, this came from these older movements and these older traditions that yeah. came with certain people that came here. And then you grow from that, and then you're reactionary. You make an entire decision based on one or two things. Yeah. And then you learn from that, and That's you get right. slapped around, and That's then right. you start to learn. And so there's been a growing, you know, a or learning curve. Maturation. Yeah. Right. Among, so, in the Muslim community, one hundred percent. Now you're running. Now you're running people, and, and they're winning. And now you have people who are strategists, and you know what they're doing, et cetera. Yeah. So it's like a twenty-year love affair between the Muslim community and and the Democratic Party. Start right, wouldn't you say? Starting with twenty, at least. I mean, yeah. starting with nine, nine post nine eleven yeah. uh, Bush response, the Obama election, the Trump the Trump election. Right. Yeah, uh, and I think Professor, you were asking about the Muslim community's evolution yeah. throughout. Yeah, throughout. Course, right. and we're now seeing some changes do you want to keep well, comment on that? I, I think we're seeing a pivotal point in which that trend is either stopping or reversing mm -hmm. correct um and and i think in terms of the community's evolution during that time it was most of that time was driven by fear legitimate fear of wanton prosecutions yeah. i mean you have to remember again young people but you guys remember i mean yeah. you had organizations that were legitimate you know organizations that were shut down charities that yeah, were shut yeah. down for no other reason than political you know play absolutely and people put behind bars for life mm -hmm. and it was it was a fishing expedition i mean everybody was looked at i mean here in chicago we had this story where the fbi was monitoring and there's there's a film by asia bundawi about this called the feeling of being watched and i think it won a lot of awards it was on hbo uh, an entire community you know the largest palestinian community in the united states was surveyed for for years, for, for 10, 15 years, where nobody was accused of any crime and nobody was arrested and no charges were made. That's right. And all of this money and time and capital, intellectually, politically, was expended in just harassing and watching these individuals just because they were Arab and Palestinian oh, and Muslim. absolutely. And that started after the first World Trade Center bombing, Clinton years. Right. And where where you had co-conspirators. That's correct. Unindicted, excuse me. Unindicted, unindicted yes, co-conspirators. And it it was a veritable list of the who's who of the American Muslim leadership. Right. Uh, you had the president of Isna, the president of Ikna. You had various uh, scholars and, and imams who were on that list. It, it was endless. Yeah, and it kept happening. Oh, it I mean, kept it was, happening. So it was, you know, I anything think, goes. Few individuals, few legal minds, few media personalities, few celebrities would stand up and say, this is BS, it needs That's to right. stop. I mean, case in point is when the Iraq war was called for, there was some pushback, pushback but mm -hmm. the majority on both sides, you know, took the pill, That's drank right. the Kool-Aid. And this wouldn't happen if the conditions of society were such that we were seen as equals or, or close to being equals. It goes back to that point that you're lesser, you are dispensable. If I screw up and I make a mistake, I'll just say, oops, I made a mistake. Right. But you couldn't do this with, with, with Belgium. You couldn't do this with Canada. You couldn't do this with Germany. I mean, today's Germany. You couldn't do this with even, I don't know, Slovenia. Like that part of the world was kind of like you could mess up and get away. I mean, we're talking about invading an entire country, killing hundreds of thousands of people, including during the sanctions when children needed medicines and food they weren't getting. Madeleine Albright saying Madeline Albright. it's worth it. And again, Bill State Clinton. Department. 
Bill Clinton's State Department. Right. Not so, Bush's. That's correct. Absolutely. But so these were we the forget. conditions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this, these were the conditions. And, yeah. and these were the years in which we did the work that we had to do. So it wasn't correct. easy. And we would get disinvited. We would get told we can't be on panels. We would mm-hmm. get told, but you have to apologize for this or condemn that or... You know, and it was you were, it was difficult. You because were doxed you're, before doxed was a thing. Yes, <laughs> daily. And and, and yeah. you're young, and you're yeah. you know resourceful, and, and 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 you're you're talented. But you have to sort of you, you have to accept that you're going to limit yeah. your your existence and your prime years to simply trying to tell your society I'm normal. Mm-hmm. So where are we today in terms of being seen as less than, and how does that inform? the current focus of your work, of the organization's work today? So there is not an immediate threat Mm -hmm. emanating from a Muslim-centric space. Like there isn't an ISIS that's flaring Ah, up or an Al-Qaeda or an Iran that's scaring the world. I mean, Mm -hmm. these things exist, but they're not front and center of threat and news, terrorist attacks. So, So a huge parenthesis around that because the moment that happens again, God forbid, yeah. So we're not at orange alert, basically, is what you're, you're not done. I mean, I'm saying, yeah, but you're not done. I say that first because, yes, short of those things, mm-hmm. and I don't know how society will, will, will react if these things happen again, yeah. and and they're projected larger than life again. But short of that, right now, we're in a much better place right. for the reason that these things are not dominating the news, but also for the reasons that society has become more familiar because of our work and your work and everybody's work, right? Coming of age with Muslims, we're less mysterious. It's harder to sabotage Muslim spaces. It's harder to stereotype Muslim identity. You see Muslims now on Apple commercials and, you know, yeah. Super Bowl commercials. And, yeah. you know, we're hitting the mainstream more ways than one. You got the rappers and the basketball players and the uh, musicians and the comedians and, and the actors and the producers and sure. culturally it's important it's, you mm-hmm. can't just have your doctors and engineers and lawyers and Absolutely. we're filling these cultural spaces yeah. more than before you're running people for office they're winning we're not nearly where we should be as a community of this caliber who represents a faith of two billion people worldwide mm-hmm. um, and who is as resourceful and as educated and as capable as our community yeah. but we're way 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 more advanced than we were 20 years, just 20 years ago when we began this work, we're mm-hmm. in a much better place yeah. in, in society. Yeah, but with your caveat that there is no big bad guy. So yes. God yeah. forbid, if something comes up, that's the real test. Yes, because yes. there are a lot of spaces in America that just kind of get distracted, but then the moment their yeah. attention is brought back, they act the same way I mean, small town America. I mean, you see this in comments on, like where Islamophobia still rears its ugly head mm-hmm. are in comments on the internet, on like oh, yeah. stories or YouTube or whatever. It's where you get you get a sense of it's still, the ignorance is still out there. Mm-hmm. The stereotype is still out there. But it isn't, it doesn't pay as well in the top echelons of society the way it did. Like media is not going to venture out and bring an Islamophobe for, for the hell of it for ratings. They did once upon a time. Mm-hmm. They're not going to produce a movie that's Islamophobic for the hell of it just to get some people to buy tickets. They did once upon a time. Politicians are not going to necessarily play into Islamophobia for votes. They did once upon a time. Very recently, Trump, you know, but I think that's changing. Now, I think if Trump were to come back, even Trump, he would know better than to go full blast on Islam and Muslims. He once said Islam hates us. That's not today's narrative. That's not what sells. You know, part of the reason is there's a new pr- bad guy. He has promised to travel ban again. I'm just but even then, that it'll be, I mean, I'll, you think it's I'll just, fight it to the to, no, to no, death. No, of course, but, of course he will. Even then, it'll be more administrative. Like, he's not going to bring back the media blitz, the, the, the propaganda uh-huh. that, that once upon a time um, was something people wanted to buy into the way they did. Part of the reason is, and this is important, for the right at least, there's a new bad guy. Hmm. And they only have time for one bad one, one bad guy at a time, right? <laughs> and that bad guy is... Is the LGBTQIA+, yes, plus, yes. all that stuff, yes. right? And it is for Muslims to a degree, for conservative Muslims. Right. And, and this is a conversation now that Muslims are going to have to have and, Muslims and negotiate. are having, I think. We're having to a degree, but we're not right. having it at the sophisticated level oh, no, that needs no. to happen. Oh, for but, sure. You know, maybe hit but we're attempting. quantity over quality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, 100%. Yeah. But, but we're at least having them. And, and, I, and I think that... <laughs> That brings me, I think, to some of the issues that I would like to talk about mm-hmm. with you. Because, again, I, I find you, Omar mentioned this at the outset. I mean, you, in addition to the work you do at CARE, you are a very astute observer of and a commentator of, of what is happening. 
within the Muslim community and without, but but certainly within the Muslim community. If we could, in the time remaining then, kind of focus our shift into what you're seeing happening and it's been exacerbated and it's out there for everyone to see because of social media. And it's also, uh, we are not immune and, and inoculated from the kind of tribal nature of politics and the tribal nature of society, you know, in the last mm-hmm. five to s- five, five years, seven years, where society at large has become so tribal, we are, we're not inoculated from that. Mm-hmm. And so as a result of that, I think we have the kind of what we're seeing in in social media and where the pendulum is sort of like rapidly shifting, Mm -hmm. I would say, in, in the opposite direction. And and re- and I think the 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 comment that you made about the new bad guy, right? I think yeah. I'm almost that has just double clicking. Yeah, huh? Uh, yeah, that has galvanized. Yeah, the Muslim imagination, because I think that no other issue. I'm, I'm not going to say no other issue, but I think that issue certainly has galvanized a lot of Muslim response. Which which sure feels to me like people sort of taking the bait. You know, it just feels like. This a lot of this is just ginned up, ginned and up. It's trying to get people. Would you agree off. with that? Uh, Ahmed? And when did it become the the when did it when was the pivot from? Uh, and, the, I mean, uh, and uh, Ahmed, uh, you said I mean, there's a nuanced yeah. conversation to be had, but, but well, let's yes. have it. No, well, well, here, but the nuanced conversation is always the last to be had. <laughs> like I think people in general, they tend to be reactionary because they're led in that direction by the thought leaders of of every time because hmm. that's what. You know, when you're dealing with crowds, you want to be, you want to simplify, you want to be black and white, and you want your special interest, you know, to to be front and center of how people think about things. So, nuance kind of, you know, messes with all of that. But nuance is where truth tends to be. So, for example, I do agree that there is an attempt by the right to co-opt Muslims into bigotry, you know, the, the sort of bigotry that, that they tend to have about certain issues uh, that once was fully targeted against us, guns, you know, fully blazing, and that some Muslims do play into that and start to mimic the same talking points and the same tone and the same attitude. But I can't leave it there because it would be unfair to suggest two things, that one, Muslims never had a position on sexuality and gender, and that they just woke up you know, yesterday and decided to go, oh, the right has just poked me and said I should have a position. What should I have? Okay, you tell me. Okay, let me take the bait. I'm in there. No, (laughs) Muslims for centuries have had these conversations. For centuries, have had a very strong position on this stuff. For centuries, have been accused. And part of the reason why they've been attacked is because they're so conservative on these issues and they're backward and they can't deal with this and deal with that. And so you can't take the hit all these centuries and all these years and suddenly, you know, let's pretend that, oh, this is a new position. Mm. So, yeah. for example, when recently some of our imams put out a very, in my opinion, milk toast milk paper, toast. right, about Islam uh, and, and gender and sexuality, they were attacked as taking the bait and hopping onto the right wing thing. I'm like, no, I mean, what do you By think commentators in media. I mean, including Muslims. Yeah, of course. No, no, no. I mean, there was an op-ed right. in the Washington, uh, New York Times. Right. So. I, I, I totally hear you. Yeah. And the problem with that is the question is, what do you think other scholars would say on this issue? Yesterday, yet last year, a hundred years ago, a thousand years ago, it would be very similar to what these guys are saying. So, so you can't really make the claim that they're taking a bait. Or now, why are they saying it now? That takes me to the second point. Well, they're saying it now because something has changed right now. It isn't the existence of LGBTQ because no. the first response that Wajahat Ali or others will give you is like, "Oh, this is not new. We've had we've had these people forever." True, but what's new then? What's new is there is a much more intense extreme. I would even say push by the lobby. That's right. This isn't about families and individuals who are just walking around like everything else. Like there are Jews and then there's a Zionist lobby. There's also LGBTQ folks and there's the lobby. Now the lobby here is going strong and laser focused on making inroads as they see it in so many different spaces that mess with the rights, the religious liberties of other people in the minds of Muslims and other conservative religious groups. So now you have a conflict. Now in the case of a conflict, what are you going to do? Just, again, become a doormat and get walked all over. You're going to stand up for your rights. Now, Muslims who are doing that, some of them will, in this instance, going back to my original point, take the bait and use right-wing, you know, sort of uh, homophobic kind of, you know. um, Vernacular. Vernacular and and, and ill-intended language and and attitudes. But others, 
And they get, and, and this is one of the tactics now of the left that I don't, I don't like. They'll sweep both groups into the same oh. black box. So others mm-hmm. in the Muslim Literally community will, being called white supremacists. Yeah, they'll, they'll go out of their way to be nuanced. They'll go out of their way to be professional and nice mm-hmm. and, 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 and concede this and that, but then say, hey, I want my kids to opt out of something that's against my religious values. And simply by saying that... Oh, you're siding with the white supremacists. It's just one big blob. Okay. So it doesn't matter if you're actually you know, a homophobic bigot, or if you're someone who just doesn't want to play along with something they don't believe in, but is respectful of everybody else's rights to do so, That's right. and treats everybody with respect and love and dignity, you're just black box. I, I have a problem with that. So I don't want to get lazy and say Muslims, like Wajahad Ali did, he got super lazy in that article in the New York Times. Why are Muslims, you know, getting on that bandwagon or whatever language he used? They're not getting on a bandwagon, but the reason why they're responding now is because there's a new threat. There's a new stimulus now. Something's that's changed. Going into the schools. That's right. You can't ignore that. You cannot ignore it. But they, they want it, a lot of Muslims even want to pretend like nothing has changed. Like this reaction is just concocted by the right to, you know, bring us in right. or bring Muslims in. There is something that's changed. Right. You can see it. You right. can see it in the statistics. Oh, you can it's see it in the they're language. the new boogeyman. Uh, tomorrow, it, it, it can be you. Like your head is still on the chopping block. Bro, we're not even talking yeah. about, I mean, at this point, if someone has, let's say, a sexual orientation that's, you know, same gender to same gender, that sounds like a classic thing compared to some of the stuff that now is being, we're being told is normal and you should accept. I mean, we're not even talking about that. So we're and talking we're, about. I would, I would also argue that if we're being fair, there's a, there is pushback coming from traditionally gay commentators and the gay community yeah. who's pushing back have a against problem with this. yeah that's right right look this is this isn't about uh, by the way islamophobia too wasn't for me about muslim versus not muslim it was always about common sense versus nonsense i like that you here flesh that too, out a little bit more though but then, i mean all i'm saying is here too this conversation i refuse to make it about you know, me being a heterosexual versus someone being a homosexual or someone of a different orientation. No, it's Entirely. not about that. Mm-hmm. It's about common sense and nonsense. So, so to me, common sense dictates that, of course, there's going to be variety in life. Some of it I'll understand, some of it I don't. I don't have to. What I do have to do is respect the right of another human being who has agency to choose differently from me yes. and to still live with dignity and respect in the same space as I live in, especially in a country like America that's built on pluralism. And I would say outside of fringe elements, I think the vast majority of people wholeheartedly- the vast majority of Muslims. Agree. And yes. no, I would even say Americans- I don't know. Rubber stamp what you're saying. Yeah, no? I don't know. I mean, some on the right <laughs> probably would, would, would not, you know- just... Well, no, no. But I mean, I'm, I'm saying that there's a there, there's the bell of curve. reasonable people. Yeah. The bell yeah. curve in yeah. the middle. Yeah. You have fringes on both sides. Yeah. But I think 20, most, reasonable most reasonable people would 20%. co-sign. You're saying, would co-sign. Right. You're saying 20% of on the fringes uh, on are speaking side. for 80% yeah. in the middle, yeah, right? Yeah. They tend to. So, yeah. so here you have- Okay, what is common sense to me? Okay. And so, but but part of that though, and this is where I want to be kind of clear, is sexuality to me, regardless of what kind, is not a public endeavor. Like I don't, hmm. as a heterosexual person, I don't support heterosexuals like jumping on the back of buses and showing me how they play out their sexuality in their private lives right. in order to attain a place in society. Or I understand if somebody else thinks otherwise and they're welcome to do it, but don't. Don't call me a bigot for not wanting to attend hmm. or not wanting to, to patronize that, you know. But I totally agree that in your private life, in your public life even, you can identify whichever way you want. Hmm. But I'm just not for public displays of wanton sexuality. I don't think that's a good idea when you have kids and people who don't want to participate in that and you, you flaunt it on them. So I'm not, I'm not a fan of that stuff. Now, yeah. Yeah. I'll just say real quick, just anecdotally, just in the last day, we, a lot of us are, talk, you know, are talking about Oppenheimer, the movie, and had not, nothing to do with LGBT issues but we're you know as muslims some of us are like oh man a christopher nolan movie that has some inappropriate scenes we're a little disappointed by that it has nothing to do with again lgbt it has to do mm-hmm. the fact that of the yeah, private versus just, the public and that's a muslim sensibility yeah. people are going to have to accept i mean we're yeah. entitled to our sensibilities and yeah. right. we are not a prudish culture okay yes and this is another mis- misconception we're not the people who say it's filthy to have right. sexual relations, and in order to get to God, close to God, I'm just going to lay it the way it is, okay? No, no, in order to get do. close to God, right. you have to forever be celibate. celibate. We're not that religion. No. With all due respect to every religion, we're just we're not that religion. No. We're a religion that embraces fully the breadth of sexual life, but within parameters, and our parameters are pretty damn clear, okay? These, these parameters are 
commitment and love. And we call that a union. And this union has a name in, in, in common, you know, a nomenclature, marriage. Yeah. Okay, but really the concept of it is commitment and love between, you know, two individuals who can then flush out their love in so many different ways, including physical. Mm -hmm. So it's a small subset of a much larger thing. That's right. But at no point, and, and then, by the way, you get extra points for being creative and loving, including physically, as a married couple. So long as you're in that space, the same act, the same act that can be haram and sinful, Outside. forbidden, you know, that can send you to hell – Outside of these parameters, right. within these parameters are not just neutral. They get you good points. I don't know what you call that in English. Hasanat. Ha hasanat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They get you good points. That's so right. if you, you know, merits whatever, or we'll whatever details, yeah, but yeah. if you're loving to yeah. your spouse, Absolutely. you get you actually get hasanat. So so it's never been about the act. It's been about the context. Mm. And why is it's not even random? Like why is it like that? Because when it's contextualized properly, then it is more worthwhile, more meaningful, more real, more sincere. Because you don't have to flaunt it. You don't have to put it on social media. You don't have to put it on the back of a bus. It's huh. really meant for that person. So it grows genuinely. A lot of times when people flaunt it and put it here and put it there, then, you know, a year later you're hearing it's done and then they're on to the next thing and That's like right. you hear with celebrities. So Muslims try to protect that. And secondly, it breeds a family. And what's more beautiful than, you know, bringing up healthy, strong children in an environment that embraces <laughs> them, et cetera, et cetera. It's family oriented. That's the way it is. Now, others can live differently. But we don't have to fully agree with the details. We just have to respect their right to live differently and treat them with the same dignity and respect we command for ourselves. It's not different from how I deal with Islamophobia. I don't say to Islamophobes, you have to say, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah, convert <laughs> or you are forever a bigot. Never. I never say you have to you know, fast Ramadan, never say you have to wear the hijab. We just simply say you can't mistreat us. You cannot, you know... Assume we, we, you know, our dignity is, is is up for grabs. You know, our, our freedoms are up for grabs, and that's it. That's all we say. Discriminate, and then, and then we're going to live differently. Yeah. We're going to do our little details differently from you, and so on and so forth. So, I don't want this whole LGBTQ debate to become about what they can do or can't do. It's more about the right to pluralistic existence, where we can, we can believe differently about certain things and not be bigots as a result of it. We do it with religion. We mm. were a multi-religious society. Yeah. Again, nobody says you're an anti-Semite if you don't believe that Jews are the chosen people, for example, or that Israel was promised them. I mean, some will say that some of the extreme Zionist, you know, uh, crowd will probably claim that you're. I mean, you wouldn't be you know, considered, but an not anti most people. You wouldn't be considered an anti-Semite if you believed that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, for example, right? Right? If it's something that's that's rejected exactly. by Judaism, exactly. So we so we get it. So this society right. gets it, but they're pretending not to get it. They're pretending to say, and I've heard in certain schools, Muslim kids be told, you don't want to be a part of this. Well, we were a part of your thing. And That's right. No, you were not a part of my thing. Nobody ever asked you to believe in what I believe in. Hmm. We just asked you to, to acknowledge my existence and treat me with respect, which the LGBTQ community is entitled to. They deserve that from everybody. Yeah. You know, and then within the, L here's another point, nuance. Within the LGBTQ camp is a whole lot of things. And we keep talking about it with one acronym or one set of letters, yeah. but there's so many different things in there. Oh, some absolutely. of which, like for example, Muslims, they accept intersex and religiously speaking, th you know, so. theologically speaking. Okay. But we have a massive problem with someone who's fully biologically and physically a male or female and then says, I feel like something else and therefore I will change myself into it. Okay. So that can still happen. You have the right to do it, but I don't have, I don't have to agree that this is a thing. I don't have to play along. So your right, your religious liberty should be protected just as much as that person's personal liberty to do what they need to do. You have the right to disagree. So that nuance is important in these conversations. And the bottom line I want to say here is, you know, don't take the bait into hating. You know, I might go to Starbucks and see someone who identifies in a way that I don't agree with. I'll treat them not just with respect, but with extra respect because probably they're going through a tough time. So my humanity would allow me to do that. My Islam will allow me to do that. But you ask me what I think about act A, X or Y, I might say, no, I don't believe in it. I, I disagree with it. Mm -hmm. So that nuance is important. But again, you're denied nuance in every conversation. Okay. We're all the dumber for it. Wow. Thank you for that very much, because I think those observations are very astute and, uh, and, and at the same time, like I said, reasonable, because they not only reasonably state our position, they also uh, are reasonable in the sense that, look, we're here to tolerate other people's right to live the life they want to live. I, I just don't need to have it displayed in my face 24-7.
right? Uh, or you can opt out. Like they, oh, they can do it, but they, I don't have to sit there and watch. Like because the you. problem is when they say yeah. you have to exactly, you have to participate. This issue has really resulted in Muslims sort of just going again hook, line, and sinker, if you will, into the dark re recesses of the far right. At least some elements. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that that's been the mainstream Muslim opinion or the mainstream Muslim position. But I think that the response is to put it, in, putting it into sort of uh, social media colloquial to, to just go full red pilled. Hmm. And we see that, I think, also playing out with uh, certain media personalities and the embrace of such personalities. And Andrew Tate comes to mind. I, I frankly, I saw it play out even during the pandemic mm -hmm. uh, with regards to positions around the vaccine, mm -hmm. positions around, um, you know, COVID restrictions, where because I think of this issue and what the left, the way the left has, has, has been essentially co-opted by the lobby, if you will, right, to go mm -hmm. back to what you yeah. said earlier, pushback from the Muslims has been to go full on mm -hmm. MAGA or full on red pill. So it's bleeding into other, the, embr the embrace of well, the Republican response to LGBT issues has bled into embrace of that, of, the, of a Republican or right response on everything. 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 And so curious, I, yeah. Ahmed, what, which, which maybe there's two or three or one or two issues, uh, where issues you, that yeah. stick out for you yeah. that yeah. you've seen Muslims do that like more. i think about a year and a half ago i would have loved to pick your like, yeah. like 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 pick your brain about the the kind of muslim response that i saw around pandemic yeah. right. and around you know covid restrictions yeah. so now though i think yeah. i think what's really timely or what what we see playing out at least again in certain so circles of social media you know if if, if mt is a thing muslim mm -hmm. twitter then then it certainly plays out there which is you know like conversations around andrew tate conversations around I think yeah, I think I think the yeah. the again, like you said, Perez, more so than the pandemic yeah. response, the masculine, mm -hmm. the response to masculinity, femininity. Right. I think frankly, yeah, I've even seen it play out with the war in Ukraine, right? Where yeah, Muslims yeah. have sort of adopted a position that just so happens to be the position of most Republicans. Yeah, do you know what I mean? It, yeah, and again, I mean, I, I understand you're, you're you're talking generally, but of I course, am. in the Muslim community, you have different sways and different directions for um, sure amongst different currents of the community etc but but look I, I think most people the average person and this is a news flash to the polemicists or maybe it isn't but they don't think in terms of right wing and, and left wing like that's not that's not a natural human thing to do okay you're not going out there and thinking where do i belong on on, on the scale and where should i sit and what have I done wrong to leave here? Maybe I should, no. They're just thinking about what seems reasonable to them at any given moment and what seems unreasonable. The problem is when you have extremism, and we are a country of extremists right now. It's funny because we spent years fighting extremism, and in the meantime, we developed our own unique brand of domestic extremism almost on every cultural facet. That's irony. Right. And, That's and right. it's on both sides. No, it's on it both is. the left and the right. right. And we're we're driven right now by a rift between extremists on both sides. We're driven and I feel like uh, many of the mainstream political actors are uh, basically speak to the fringes. Because that's that that is now the domin dominating and domineering force. Is, that's right. Is extremism. Period. That's right. And you you mentioned, for example, passingly, or when you were talking about algorithms, if we're talking about social media in particular, the algorithm rewards. That's right. That uh, kind 100%. of behavior. Yeah, and that's part of. And it. that gets can, amplified. Right, because you can you know you can sit there and study and analyze why. I mean, I'm just basically right now making observation, but the why is important. We don't have time for the why, but yeah, part of it is the nature of social media algorithms algorithms part of it is the pendulum swing that tends to happen in right. cultural phenomenon right. phenomena etc but in, but in, going back to muslims so people in general muslims included they don't necessarily think in terms of right wing and left wing that's the polemicists okay. and especially the extremists among them who are who are pounding the idea that you got to sit in one corner and, and play through it for life so what happens when there is an idea that someone doesn't like and then you're not allowed to talk about it and then somebody comes along, he's bold enough, eloquent enough, has enough charisma and finally says, screw it, I'm going to talk about it and he says essentially a lot of the things that you were thinking. What's going to happen is you're going to see this person as a hero. The problem with that is you then take everything this person comes with 
along with what drew you to this person to begin with. And that's, again, a human phenomenon. And Mm -hmm. it's a cause of of much problems in the world. And it happens on both sides of the political spectrum and the cultural spectrum. You know, so Muslims are not immune to it. So when they're looking at someone like Andrew Tate and they see in him a heroic figure. Or Jordan Peterson. They probably don't even know that much about him. Yeah, I I bet you anything. Mm -hmm. Or Jordan Peterson or any of those guys. A lot of times, people who lionize these individuals know only you know, tidbits and fractions of their life right. and, and their rhetoric. But they know the stuff that appeals to them and they want to keep listening to it. Right. But they take the person en masse wholesale because, again, that's a natural human thing to do. It's easier. Mm. You know, it's less stressful on your mind. Yeah. But if you were to show them certain other aspects, maybe they'll, 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 they'll realize that this person, again, is nuanced and has good and bad. Or maybe they're so impressed by the parts that they like that they'll just look away and this happens more often than not. That's right. But so someone like Andrew Tate, again, when you come from an extremist perspective, he's all bad. When you come from another extremist perspective, he's all good. Both are silly and both are not really going to appeal to a searching mind. Like many things in life, Andrew Tate, like many people, he has his good and bad sides. And if you acknowledge that, it doesn't make him any better. It doesn't make you any weaker. It makes you smarter and capable of analyzing him better. So aspects of Andrew Tate that are good, objectively, he's smart as a whip. He's got good memory, good eloquence, good charisma, good stage presence. These are all objectively true. He's a smart guy. I mean, he's a chess master. His father was a chess master. He's a disciplined guy. He's fit. He works out. He was a um, boxing, you know, yeah. world champion. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, there's much to admire about him. Good-looking guy, you know, presentable. A lot of the things he says, some of the things he says are true. Right. When he talks about how masculinity is dying in the West, how it is being penalized, how the opposite is being you know, glorified as, as, as the go-to thing and you know, effeminate you know, men and masculine, et cetera. And this appeals to a lot of people who are seeing, again, right. extremism from the other side. That's right. And I think that right there, I think, identifies the uh, attraction to people like Tate because they are speaking to issues that- again, Vacuums. Exactly. You know, and they're filling exactly. vacuums at very exactly. opportune and necessary moments, right. okay? Right. So then he converts to Islam and he converts for a lot of the right reasons. He says things that are very true about the nature of what Islam is and isn't and you know what the devil is and God, etc. Mm-hmm. You listen to him and he's appealing in many ways. Now, you look at the same guy and he's led a life that he thinks is top G and amazing and top 1% everybody should aspire to. And it's pretty gimmicky and, 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 and corny. And what's the word you get, you know, young people use cringe, right? (laughs) Maybe you need to be older to realize that. I think he'll realize it in his lifetime. I promise you that. He's going to look back and and go, what the heck? You know, this is really cringe because, you know, this isn't the point. And uh, hopefully as he gets into Islam and he he unpacks the the core of Islamic values, he'll realize that the the top Islamic value to be had for a human being is humility (laughs) because it's from that point that you realize the greatness of God and your limitation, yeah. and it's from that point that you begin. You can begin to have a proper relationship with God, and know that you're not really in charge. You don't really have that much power. So this whole haughty kind of like, let me be, you know, top G. I'm the strongest. I'm the best. I'm the smartest. I'm, most of the time, you're not in charge of what happens to you. Mm-hmm. So he'll come to terms, hopefully, if he has the right teachers, with that point. But a lot of his brand is driven by this BS, false veneer of strength, and you know, power and wealth and uh, cigars, you know. cars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, obviously well, with it. The, flashing it, I think flashing it, wielding it over people that he considers weaker than him. And and whether that's the opposite. It's, it's him not, opposite not having sex. a clue right, about exactly. how, how life yeah. works. And but, him, you know. but I, well, I, but and, I do and, agree I mean, the with you. The ways in which he discusses yeah. the opposite yeah. sex, I think, needs to right. be correct. Identif- right. uh, correct. He's yeah. toned it down. And he claims that when he had 100 views, he's a different animal than when he has a million views. And he's partially correct in the fact that, you know, he was going for more shock value before, well, like he purposefully. Knew, he knew how to play the system. But he doesn't really believe a lot yeah. of these things. He doesn't yeah. even do a lot of these things. I'm willing to believe that. What's he, what he's accused of, I'm going to leave to the courts. But in general, his claim is that this was shtick and that if you ask the women in my life, if you ask me my honest opinions about women, I want to protect her. He has all these responses yeah. to it. Yeah. But nonetheless, nonetheless, he's not to be excused from his legacy unless he can show a different legacy. Because okay. you can't have legacy in action and then repentance in words or a different direction in words. It also has to be an equal action, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm one of those guys, and I've said this on social media, and it's the only comment I've ever made about him, is it's a wait and see. I'm mm-hmm. willing to give him the benefit of a doubt as a brother who's mm-hmm. came, come into the faith, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to jump on his bandwagon and, and applaud him. It's going to be a wait and see. Mm-hmm. He needs to grow into the values that we hold dear. 
Because you're coming to me, I'm not coming to you. Mm, <laughs> and like once you do, then welcome on board. I mean, welcome on board anyway. I'm not judging. He's a slam. Allah does that. But as far as a com community person, I want you, I want to see you publicly. You're a public figure, bro. I want to see you publicly live out my values that you claim you came for. And if you're living out different values, you're a public figure. Then don't tell me I'm judging the guy. Don't judge the guy when I say he's doing that. I'm just going to say, well, he asked me to judge him. He's out. He's a public figure. So. You know, I have mixed feelings about him. I think he's smart. I think he's onto something with a lot of his views. I think he's filling, filling a vacuum. He's definitely watchable. But I think he's very cringe in, in, in that aspect of materialism, yeah. of which his way of, his misogyny, if you will, is a subset. But the larger, the larger aspect is materialism. I agree. Right? I he agree. has this corny materialism That's right. that he applies to, to money and wealth and his body and his looks and women. But not only the women issue, right? It's just part of this larger. I think if he starts to see the folly of that, he might be someone who's a public intellectual who people can listen to. Mm -hmm. um, uh, by the way, Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh, you listen to these guys, you know, Candace, Candace Owens, they have certain things that they say that ring true right. and they're well said. And they have other things that they say that are complete uh, obsessions. They're, they're just obsessed. Like the way he's talking about the Barbie movie. He, I might have a problem with the movie. I haven't seen it. I might. But I'm not going to... He obsesses about them, and he makes them larger than life. It's almost... This is the problem with the right. They did this with Islam. Mm -hmm. Right? They were wrong when, about Islam to begin with. But then it was an obsession. But now the obsession, obsession. is wokeism. Right. right. Is, is the woke. Right. So, so they always need something to hit on. They always need something yeah. to chew on. They always need something to show you why the world is falling apart. But then you look at, you look at them and they're not a... a massively better alternative i mean yeah. you know whether you look at some of these churches and the way the control happens in there and the psy psyops in those churches mega churches you know the way they talk about god is not very appealing mm. you know it's ours and they hit everybody else who's not part of that and you know so obviously there are lovely christians and lovely people on the right as well but but where the far right sits is not a pretty place and muslims need to be careful that even as they spew certain things that ring true don't assume this whole space, you know, like you say, uh, lock, wheel, and barrel, or, or sink and hooker, <laughs> but be, be basically nuanced about what you take and what you leave, right. and know that you don't need to exist in one corner fully, but Sad. also know that Islamophobia today politically is festering on the right more than on the left, and so just be careful as you deal with these LGBTQ issues. The same people that hate them might hate you. And so the question becomes, do you go with a group that might tolerate you, but tolerates them too, or one that doesn't tolerate what you have a problem with, but you're part of the problem as well? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> no, I think you, you know, that. back back in the '90s, I was in high school, and and I think you know, I used yeah. to listen to Rush Limbaugh. Yeah, I was, right. a, I was a ditto head. Ditto head. Mm. And I remember talking to a friend, of uh, Pervez's cousin, Omar Sultan. I was like, "Oh, Rush Limbaugh, he's great." I was like mm. a sophomore in high school, mm. and he goes, "Zach." I don't think he likes you very much. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Right. yeah. I, I, I like that. I also like the resonated when you said corny materialism because mm -hmm. we feel it, you know, on, on social media, which are really ad platforms at the end of them, at the end of yeah, the day, people yeah. don't realize, but calling it corny is such a perfect takedown of that. But, uh, but this is the, this is what defined our work. Remember I told you, this is how we mm -hmm. dealt with the right wing on Fox. You have to have the confidence. I want our children to learn this. You have to have the confidence to define yourself, not be defined by someone else, and then have that person conform to your definitions. You're the leader in this game because you know your faith, you study it from its proper sources, from the wisdom of the Prophet. The Quran says, and I don't want to get too religious here, but the Quran does talk about الْكِتَابَ to teach you the book and wisdom. They're separated mm -hmm. out. The book itself alone will not alone teach you wisdom mm -hmm. because wisdom is designed only to be passed from human to human. It can never pass from paper to human. So in order for the kitab, which had all the knowledge, to become person, personified and be taught as wisdom, the prophet had to exist. Correct. It was as, as important as the Qur'an in the message. So we look to him and those who learn from him, and it comes, it trickles down like a waterfall, to learn that wisdom. Anybody who goes through that wisdom, welcome. Anybody who challenges it, we don't take their <laughs> colors over ours. We have them color with our culture, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. so you got to know that we're corny materialism is not a thing for us. We don't do that because we know better of it. We know that we're from dust to dust. We know that however strong you are, you're going to become weak and, you know, die one day. So don't embrace that part of it. You can be strong, but don't embrace it as like coming from yourself and something that, you know, you've accomplished. You can be wealthy, 
but you give money to the poor and you don't embrace it as an identity and you run with it and I'm successful, everybody else is a failure, I'm top G. That's not, that's not our culture. That's not a religion. So if someone's going to come along and do that, you can't look at them and say, I'm going to, I'm going to drop this religion and this wisdom and this prophet and this guy now is going to be my shining light. Hmm. But you can also say this guy has certain things that I admire, certain things that I like, he's disciplined, he works out, he's good at chess, he's smart, he has some ideas. But you know, you got to be nuanced, right? Don't take the baby and the bath water. Throw out the bath water, hold on to the baby. <laughs> and that's yeah. kind of the theme of all these yeah. topics, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I if, agree. If I can add just one thought, um, we're talking about the algorithm. You know, this is the problem. Right. If you're talking about like YouTube or social media, it's this algorithmic feedback loop because Andrew Tate will bounce you over to Ben Shapiro, who bounces you over to Steven Crowder, who bounces you over to Candace Owens, to, to uh, mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson, you name it. And so you're, you're inundated by the illusion of... Uh, you know, diversity of thinkers, Thank but you. they're all articulating the same yeah. message. And you're like, well, this this is obviously capital T true. Remember the clicks mm. conversation we had earlier? Mm. I mean, it's how yeah. America functions. It's true on the left too. Yeah. I mean, if you throw yourself into oh, one yeah. of the loopholes of, of no, the left sure. no media, doubt. you're going no to be spinning around in those spaces all no the doubt. time as well. 100%. And they right. become echo chambers. And you got yeah, echo chambers does. on both sides. And again, America now is becoming a land of extremism. Uh -huh. We're incapable of talking to each other across an aisle. Hmm. We're incapable of having a proper conversation that is for the common good. Republicans and um, Democrats are in a way worse off than Ukrainians and Russians. I mean, the other guys, you know, they're using guns, but here it's still enemy versus enemy. Hmm. Yeah. But they've just learned to do it in a, in, a, in a way through a certain system, which mm -hmm. I guess is better off. But at the end of the day, it's not good for the future of America if we can't look at ourselves as Americans first rather than as two separate entities that are going for the jugular all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Um, we could keep going. But uh, that's I know right. We're out of time. I could, I could literally listen to you for hours and, and, and I think discuss issue after issue, but, uh, Thank you so much, Emma. Oh, thank it's, you guys. It's been amazing. It's been a I, pleasure know, speaking with you guys. Next trip to Chicago or the next time you're in the Bay, we, we want to have you back. So It'd be my pleasure. For now, it'll be deep dish pizza. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah. So uh, obviously, I think people know where they can find you. You're active. You, you do write on Facebook. People can definitely check you out there. Uh, websites, Care, I imagine, Care Chicago. That's right. CareChicago.org. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and find out the work that you're doing there. But again, thank you for your time. Thank you for making this stop on our Chicago travel to be such a memorable one. And it's thank been a you pleasure, for the gentlemen. Yeah, and Until the hospitality that you've so shown us um, here in your beautiful offices. Yeah, so so good to actually meet you in person after following <laughs> following you on Facebook for years. So like great. Like, it was a pleasure for me. Thank you so much, all of you. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.